What's good, Harsh? Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you as well. How are you doing? Doing well, uh, getting uh, ready for the year. How about yourself? All killer. Man, 2022 just whizzed by. I didn't even realize it and it was gone. Man, I've been hearing so many people just say the same exact thing. And did you ever see that one uh, Twitter page that has like the progress bar of how much of the year that we're complete with? Oh, yeah. I love that account. It it, it it gives you that bar and, you know, it adds like 1% each time and tweets it out every three, four days. Yeah. I saw a bunch of comments that just said that from that account, they were just like, man, this year just flew on by. I wonder if us bringing so much awareness, uh, like with numbers and charts, just brings like makes the time fly by quicker versus like four years ago. We didn't really even see a bar like that, and we could be more in the present. I don't know. I don't know. I think that you just get used to time passing away as you do stuff that is similar in nature. And I've heard from older people that the sensation of time passing accelerates as you get older. For example, Mm. when you're 16... A year feels much longer than a year at 25, than a year at 45, than a year at 75. It's because at 16, a year has a lot of new information for your brain. But at 75, there's very little new stuff happening. So it's just a lot of the same old stuff and your brain doesn't store all of it. Hmm. Is that why like the midlife crisis is a thing? I don't know. I've never had a midlife crisis. Do you know anyone? <laughs> do you know anyone that did have a midlife crisis? Define midlife crisis. Like, what do you mean by that exactly? So it's a phrasing that says that roughly around forty-five to fifty, uh, people start to evaluate their life and see if they're making progress or they're feeling left behind. And it normally happens around the forty to fifty range. If they think that they're behind. They start to have this sort of identity crisis, this depression. And I wonder if that ties into the idea that you just said, where at that age, you're not getting that much new information. So maybe the midlife crisis caused because these people just think that they're living life on repeat mode at this point. I don't know. I don't know if it's an Indian concept or if it's mainly a Western concept. The midlife crisis. Have you heard of the phrasing before? I've heard of the phrasing before. Um, I thought it was mostly related to money, though, and not about the whole emotional aspect of it. Mm-hmm. I've, If that's the definition of a midlife crisis, then I've been through a quarter-life crisis when I was like 19 years old, maybe. Like, wait, am I actually using my time correctly or not? And will I actually get what I want to get in the next 10 years? So mm-hmm. I had a quarter-life crisis, you could say, not a midlife crisis. But uh, I don't think that's what causes a midlife crisis. I think what happens is that people, at least in our case, like at least, you know, we, we, I don't know about you, but I spend eight to nine hours a day looking at my computer screen because I'm working and everything that I do involves a computer. And if you do that for the entire year, you kind of feel like the year just went by really quickly because you didn't do too much different stuff so what i remember from my year are all the treks i've been on all the traveling i did but i don't remember the work i did because my brain is just compressed it into you know one day so the 300 day, days you worked in the year is just as good as one day for your brain throughout your day do you have a lot of variable activities where things are different on the computer screen or is it pretty much you doing the same thing there are a lot of variable activities but at the end of the day, you're still just looking at the screen, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you're doing work and you're doing different types of work. But let's say that you spend eight hours coding on day one and eight hours coding on day two. But the thing you coded is different. If you keep doing that for a while, at some point, your brain is just going to be, okay, so you coded, that's it. It's not going to save like on day one, you coded this, day two, you coded this. It's going to forget the details and just remember like the gist of something. Mm -hmm. And if the gist is just small, it's going to remember the small stuff. Yeah. It's going to just compress it. Yeah. It's, um, 
it, it just sees the blob. Harsh. So there was this one event that I went to. It was a networking event. And the guy that I was talking to, uh, he found out that I wrote a book. And as soon as he saw that, he's like, you wrote a book? Well, go on. Uh, tell me more. And he was expecting like this grand narrative of me, like, you know, talking about the book and how energetic and stuff it was. But anyone that's wrote a full on book, not just like a PDF, uh, like that's 10 pages. I'm talking like 200 to 300 pages. It's one of the most repetitive processes out there. And you wake up in the morning, you maybe get some coffee, go to the gym. Then you come back and you're front of the computer screen. Uh, you're just typing away. Then you look outside and it's dark. It's nighttime. And the day just flew on by. And some authors are doing this for months. Some people are doing it for years. And some people are doing it for decades. So writing a book is very similar to what you're talking about. Like, it seems like this grand experience, but it's a very boring thing that you're just executing it. Mm, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I, I, I know what you're talking about. How much time did you spend writing your book? How, how many days did it take? Well, each one is different. I, um, I have a pretty simple workflow. So my workflow is way different than a guy like Jordan Peterson, who like reanalyzes each sentence as he writes it. So for him, it'll take like six years to write a book. For me, it could take <laughs> like two to three months just due to our processes. But as this guy was like, oh, go on, tell me about your day. I'm like, how am I going to explain my day in a way that I don't kill the dreams of this uh, aspiring author. <laughs> I was like, and there yeah. I was typing, and there was a dragon that was chasing me. <laughs> what do you want to say, bro? <laughs> Every time I go out, all the girls follow me. <laughs> <laughs> What's hilarious is that um, with writing a book, it's one of the, it seems easy, by the way, but it's very difficult because you have to think. And Henry Ford once said that thinking is one of the hardest jobs out there. That's why so few people do it. But you're not just thinking in spurts. You're thinking for a long duration of time. So it's going to really test you. So I don't know how so many authors are fat and out of shape. I'm like, it's so hard for me to think when I'm not healthy. Is, is it like that for you too? Actually, not like that for me in the sense that I, I'll tell you what. I finished my chartered accountancy exams. I don't even remember a long time ago, let's say like a half a decade or more ago. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these exams, but they're supposed to be one of the hardest exams in India where mm. say one out of 10 people makes it. So they have these three sets of exams. So first as the entrance, then there's a middle level and the hard last level. And the entrance exam has a 30%, 40% passing rate. The middle level has about a 15% passing rate and the final level has like 10% passing rate. So if you start it and, you know, if you do everything in the first try, it takes about five years, four and a half years to finish your degree. And most people take, you know, of course, more than one try given the passing percentages. And about say one in 10 people or one in eight people will pass this entire thing in one attempt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I passed all of these exams in one try. And oh, wow, impressive. I became fat as hell while I was studying for the last <laughs> one and the middle one and the first one. So when you do the first one, the, the gap between the first exam and the second exam is one year. And the second exam takes one year to prepare for. So I was studying continuously for a year and a half. And I hadn't become obese. I wouldn't say obese, but I was definitely at 25, 28% body fat by the end of it. Because all I was doing was I was just sitting and studying. So I was at home with my books, sitting on my bed or just going to the class and studying Day and night, I'm not even joking. I was studying like 15, 14, 13 hours a day for a year and a half. Mm. So it was insane. But uh, yeah, I made it at the end. I didn't feel like I couldn't think because I was not fit. I was definitely unfit back then. And then the, the gap between the second and the third exam is three years, I think. 
so by then i had lost all the weight so after the second exam i lost all the fat i was looking pretty good i was at maybe 18 17% body fat and yeah i did notice that my thinking had improved but it it wasn't significant i wouldn't notice it and by the end of the final exams i was once again at 35% body fat maybe i'm not not 35 but i could possibly have been at 30 to 35% body fat Mm-hmm. simply because i was studying for an entire year i think the last 6 months i was just at home sitting in my bed and studying and you know it's a very stressful exam so you're eating a lot so i still cleared in the first attempt and this is supposed to be a really hard exam so i don't think that you need to be fit specifically to think clearly at least not in my experience well with these exams they're pretty much consumption right or are you creating no, anything no, oh, you have no, to create no. as well okay well hold that thought because i do have a question in regards to this as you were explaining that how much years are you investing in this entire process for you and mentioned four and a half okay so what if after the first exam you have to wait 3 years right mm mm-hmm. after what the if, second exam you have to wait 3 years yes well, what if what if after the second exam you want to switch career paths does that ever happen you can by then you've lost all the work you've done so yeah. you, you don't get anything out of giving the first two exams you have to finish the entire thing to get the thing man that is a time consuming process how old were you throughout these stages i think i finished it all at 21 so i was when i started i must have been 16 or 18 i don't remember do you still use any of the knowledge from those experiences in your current day life I use a lot of it in business actually. So I think accounting is the best business education out there. And what I learned basically was accounting, auditing, costing, and a lot of these financial subjects like you know SFM, I don't know if you know what that means, It's financial management and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I use that pretty much every day, right? When I'm dealing with money, when I'm investing, when I'm making money, when I'm managing the working capital for the business. So I think it was an extremely useful degree when it comes to business all i can say is that there are portions of it that i haven't used at all mm-hmm. but overall i would say that if i knew that i would not be using this degree directly and just be doing business i would have cut the nonsense out and just gotten all the useful information in maybe 3 years yeah that's the unique thing with math related fields even the stem it's like once you let's say do engineering or something mathematics related and let's say you don't want to pursue that career anymore a lot of the skills that you learned harsh you could apply it later on in your life where in college like one of the gold standard is like if you're a doctor like you're going to make it but the thing with being a doctor is that you're spending so many years just studying right you got to do residency you got to do all these exams you got to shadow under another doctor it's a I would say it's a decade plus long process. But at the same time, the engineers and the accountants are graduating and they're getting their work experience and they could probably even invest in businesses on the side. So when you factor in the whole thing, it's like I don't know if I would ever want to be a doctor. And did you hear recently that a lot of doctors are quitting their jobs? I did not hear that actually. Tell me more. Well, I've just been seeing a, a bunch of these YouTube videos, these Twitter accounts that are like, uh, "I'm quitting being a doctor, and here's why." And then, you know, as I watch some of the content pieces, they talk about how it's very stressful, and there are different ways to make money nowadays. Uh, that's one reason. Another reason is because the culture within a hospital is very, very toxic. It's like everything is decentralized. Some of the nurses are overworked, underpaid. They're showing attitude to the doctors. Doctors are showing attitude back. Patients are yelling. It's a very hectic environment to be in. So some of the doctors are like, being a doctor for these past 3 years have at least shaved off 2 years of of, of my life. Uh, and it's just like <laughs> it's just like a bunch of these um things that I never knew about because First of all, I don't go to the hospital too much. I don't know how often you go to the hospital, but if you're not a doctor, our perception, like especially as a brown kid, is like this is the gold standard, <laughs> you know? So hearing the dark sides of the field was like, whoa, I was not expecting that at all. 
That's interesting. That that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, I mean, it, like, what's the perception of doctors there? Like, it just made me respect the doctors that are still grinding it out, uh, because um, I, I didn't know about the dark sides of it. Like, the closest to a doctor I'll go to is the dermatologist. Like, whenever I get like a bald spot, I have to go to the dermatologist. They give me a shot. And there's this sweet woman. Her name's Catherine. She owns the practice. All of her uh, workers are so freaking toxic, man. They're like always on the phone texting and stuff. And it's like the dermatologist, she just makes the entire experience bearable. But everyone else, it's like uh, they just don't want to be there. So I wonder if this is an attitude that's just permeating the medical field. Hmm. I can definitely say that that is not the case in India. Not not here at least. Mm-hmm. Um, regarding going to a hospital, I think the last time I went to one was I don't know ten years ago. It it I don't know. It, it, how do you define a hospital? I mean, like a major hospital was ten years ago. I had LASIK about five years ago. So that you was also LASIK? yeah. I had LASIK. Hmm. So that was about five years ago at an eye hospital. So that's if that counts as going to the hospital, then yeah, I've been to hospital. Yeah, that counts. That definitely <laughs> counts, man. Were you scared? No, the LASIK is the best surgery ever. It takes like seven seconds to get the surgery in the sense that. So my power earlier was negative four ish in both eyes. So I couldn't see much without my glasses. I could see everything, but it was really, really blurred. I couldn't read. It, it was just very annoying. Mm-hmm. And uh, I knew this one guy who has a eye hospital. He's a very popular doctor in India. and He's a friend of mine. So we were just chatting and I was telling him, okay, so I'm thinking of getting this LASIK thing done. And he's like, okay, come to me tomorrow. And I thought it was just going to be a consultation. He was just going to answer some questions. And I'm like, okay, let's... I went to him tomorrow. I went to his hospital. Mm-hmm. And he did did this entire scan thing on my eye. And he says that, uh, so apparently you can only get LASIK done if your corneas are thick enough. And if your corneas are thin, then you can't get LASIK done. You have to get something called PRK or something like that done instead. So he said, my corneas are extremely thick, so I'll be perfect for LASIK. And he did that entire scan of my eye. And he's like, the surgery is going to be for 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. And you can get it done whenever you want. And you just have to wear those, you know, protective glasses for a week. And then you'll be good. You can't go swimming for a month and you can't lift weights for a month. And that's it. So I schedule a surgery the week after. And the surgery, this is the entire surgery, okay? And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not even kidding you. This is the actual thing. I went in the room. I lied down. Out of the 15 minutes, he spent the first 10 minutes just cleaning my eyes, putting various drops. Then he put this device on my eye, which put a lot of pressure on my eye. It wasn't painful Mm. at all. It was just uncomfortable. And my vision just went dark for like one second. And I no pain whatsoever, just feel slightly uncomfortable. Then the doctor said, okay, so look into the laser. So you just have to look in the laser for like 10 seconds or 7 seconds. Yeah. And that's it. That's your surgery. After you look into that laser for seven, eight seconds, you can see perfectly clear right away. Whoa. Then, yeah. So the entire surgery, the surgery portion of it was like one minute for each eye. That entire darkening process. Then you look at the laser and then your eye is perfect. You can see everything perfectly. So I went in with that negative four power. I couldn't see anything. In 15 minutes, I came out, out of which, you know, seven seconds for each eye for the surgery, zero pain. The only thing I could smell was like, you know, the smell of burning hair because the Mm -hmm. laser is burning some of your eye. So you can smell that a little bit. And then they put like a contact lens thing on your eye, like a bandage, put a lot of drops. You don't feel the need to blink at all because they've put so many drops in your eye. There is zero pain whatsoever. And you can instantly see clearly. And I'll tell you what, I got this thing done. It's called custom wavefront LASIK. So it's supposed to be like a tailor-made version of LASIK for your own eyes. And the difference between glasses and seeing from your eyes is huge. 
when you look at when you look through glasses you know things kind of spread out and sometimes they're too concentrated on the sides yeah that's not the case with lasik but now that i'm seeing normally everything is clear and the colors are better so green is more green red is more red mm-hmm. it's hard to explain for someone who hasn't got it, gotten it done and immediately everything was perfectly clear i could read that entire eye spelling chart and i just went home he gave me a bunch of drops i put those for like a month i think one of my eyes my left eye had a slight allergic reaction to the laser he had to give me some anti allergy drops i put those in and i was perfectly good i haven't looked back at all everything is fine i can still see perfectly clear and that What? surgery is life changing were there any like maintenance stuff like do you still have to put eye drops in every now and then or is it just done like you don't have to do any maintenance stuff with your eyes uh i don't have to do anything to, with my eyes i do have these eye drops they're called rewetting drops and i do put them in when my when my eyes feel dry mm-hmm. but i i had this issue even before lasik my eyes would get dry when i would look at the computer for too long mm. so so i don't think it's related to lasik the only minor issue I don't even know if it's an issue but when you're at night and you look at like a really bright light you get a bit of starburst how do you know what I mean starburst uh, I mean like it hurts your eyes let me show you let me show you so I did an article on this so okay I'm going to present a screen Okay, can you see my screen? Mhm. Okay, so this is the halo thing. So this used to happen a lot, but after like a month or two, it's barely around. It's still around a little bit, but barely. And you also get a starburst, for example, when you're driving at night. You get some starburst. Let me see. Oh, you're talking about those stuff. I know what you're talking about. I no, that no, normally I'm not happens. About, I'm not talking about that. that. One second. Oh, no, not the halo. Yeah, this stuff. Yeah, some a little like this, not as bad, but mm. slightly close to this. Yeah. So if someone has their, you know, far distance lights on, you'll see this thing. It makes it hard to see. So that's the only disadvantage I've seen with LASIK. Yeah, so it becomes a little like the middle thing, not nearly oh. as much, but a little bit. I mean, is that the main bad stuff about the LASIK, or do you have any other bad stuff? No, that's the main bad stuff. You don't even notice it because you just get used to seeing it that way. And uh, that it, this is mainly mainly the concern for like the first year, at least in my case. So after the first year, either I stopped noticing it or it stopped happening. Oh okay. Man, that's such an interesting story because LASIK here is considered something that it's like a last case scenario. <laughs> For the most part you should get glasses or contacts and if you're if you have a lot of money or if it's an emergency, then you get LASIK. So the preconceptions a lot of people have is that oh man, LASIK is a time consuming process. It may even be a year process. But What? the way you yeah, but the way you're, you're describing it is that it just happened in 15 minutes the actual procedure part yeah it's a 15 minute thing it's not a time it's not time consuming at all and it was pretty cheap i don't know what you guys are on about i think medicine in your country is really expensive in india it's extremely cheap you weren't scared or anything like be, nah, be real but, like, don't be like no no i wasn't scared at all but, like if you were really scared i wasn't scared i had a lot of friends who had gotten this stuff done earlier mm-hmm. and uh, i knew the doctor he is a good friend of mine actually and his son is also a friend of mine So I trusted the doctor he's extremely popular in India one of the best doctors here he owns mm-hmm. his own hospital so I just went to him and I had to kind of convince him to take my money <laughs> <laughs> he was going to give it to you for free he's a friend of mine so he didn't want to charge me yeah, but, but I'm, I, I, I'm I, I don't that... like taking like, free shirts so I like okay I, I don't know how much is the market price for LASIK but I did pay him money but I don't know if he like charged he, he gave me like a massive discount or whatever Did you consider it expensive or is no, it very it's affordable? It's cheap as hell. It's cheap as hell. Like my friends in India, they haven't gotten this custom wavefront LASIK. They've gotten the standard LASIK done. 
and mm-hmm. they paid like 500 bucks for it for both highs 500 okay. us dollars yeah i would say this is a field that there's not too much awareness on like every now and then like when someone says oh i did lasik they're looked at like a unicorn like wait what uh, tell me more you know is it like that over in india is it like a lot of people are curious like uh, what what what's lasik like they're like oh okay everyone does lasik everyone does lasik it, it's really common here mm. in fact there are people in my village you know just kids in my village 17 18 19 year olds Mm-hmm. who who have like family members who have done lasik and most people in india nowadays before getting married will get lasik done like I, i don't i shouldn't say most but at least from my hometown most people would get lasik done before they get married what about glasses are, are did you ever wear glasses i wore glasses for like 12 years mm. did you did you would you say you looked good in glasses or no 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 i did not i had mm. my power was too big it was it was minus 4 and what would happen is that if your power is big mm-hmm. the glasses break up your face oh okay do you know what i mean not really but um so if you look directly at a person with a with a big power mm-hmm. what happens is that their face it looks normal the forehead looks normal the eye section looks either too small or too big mm-hmm. and the the down side of the face looks normal so You know this the edge of the face it does it's not continuous you see like a break there i don't know how to put it bro have you uh, this is a little slight change of topic but it's actually talking about what we're talking about have you ever seen a very fat guy who was funny but then he lost weight and he wasn't as funny I I know what you're talking about. I haven't met people like that, but yeah, the, I know the, what you mean. Oh, well, yeah, even if you saw someone like that like uh, there was a show called Drake and Josh like um Josh was the very fat guy and he was like the comedic aspect of the show. Uh but suddenly when he lost uh, that much weight and he was skinny, his jokes weren't really hitting the same. And this is a very bad thing to say because like, his health is definitely more important than the audience's laughs. But if I'm just being objective, like I wasn't the only one who was thinking that. multiple people were like man Josh just isn't as funny as he once was right was well, the same thing i've noticed with people that wear glasses all their lives and then, then suddenly when they go to contacts they're like hey, you just look like a different person right now like your eyes look smaller um i don't know if you've ever noticed that. okay you're, you're over here posting a picture what, what is this uh i'll answer what you said but this is what i mean by break the face breaks up so do you see this guy's eyes they're smaller than the rest of his face Yeah. So yeah, I, I didn't look good in glasses because my power was too high. So this this would happen oh, to me. Oh, I I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. And that doesn't even look like stylish glasses. Like nowadays a lot of glasses they look stylish or you can't even see the frames. It, it looks very artistic. But the point that I was trying to make was that some people they could wear glasses very well and you know how fashion influences a lot of opportunities in life. Like if you're over mm-hmm. here about to give a speech and you you have a mustard stain on your shirt, people just aren't going to take you seriously. A lot of people that wear glasses subconsciously other people view them as more competent. Even if they're not as competent, they'll be like, "Hmm, th- th- this guy got glasses." And I I used to be like, "No, nah, no, nah, that's not the case." But a lot of people make decisions like that without conscious awareness. They're like, "Hmm, this guy has glasses. He seems pretty well put together. He seems like an intellectual thinker." And then boom. So glasses actually have some role in perception. That's true. In fact, I've heard that a lot of law firms what they would do is they would give their client even if they don't have glasses, mm-hmm. they'll make them wear glasses in court just so that they seem more sincere. Mm, okay. So that's actually a thing. It's actually a thing. Yeah. Regarding what you asked earlier about contact lenses, I have worn contact lenses a lot. They're just not as good as LASIK. You know, you have to keep re-wetting them and you have to take care of them you have to wash them every day and it's just a waste of time and money mm-hmm. because that liquid is expensive and it's it's not the same it's not the same you know it's it's more like it's a hacky solution doesn't do the job as well as lasik does and it has other issues which pe- some people will not uh, you know appreciate but for example if you do mma mm-hmm. have you ever done a roundhouse kick yeah So you your face turns a lot right when you do a roundhouse kick. Mhm. But the gla- the contact lenses will not turn at the same rate as your face turns. So if you spin, the contact lens will have a delay 
it'll it'll change but it, it's going to catch up to your eyelid for your eyeball after like 0.1 seconds so after you kick for like half a second you can't see anything and then the contact lens will also come back to your eye and then you can see yeah if you're a fighter you definitely need to get your get a lasik i can't even I imagine a fighters, fighter having contacts <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah gonna, i would not recommend uh, those contact lenses it's just too annoying lasik is a really simple surgery it's cheap as hell just get it done don't think about it get the you... custom wavefront lasik done if you can afford it otherwise get the standard 500 dollar lasik done people mm. can see just fine through that did you ever have braces no man screw that shit <laughs> <laughs> did you always have good teeth or you're just one of those guys that's like i need braces but i just won't get it i have always had good teeth okay There What was about certain, you? No man there was a certain period where I had a teeth like right here like it was like th- this is where all my teeth is but it was like on the top of my gums and one day I told my parents I thought this was cool and they're like oh my like w- what's wrong with your mouth I was like what and then they take me to the dentist the dentist takes me to the orthodontist and they're like son you need braces and for some reason like I was super excited I was like yes I get to have braces And I told my brother I was like haha I get to have braces and you don't. And he's like I don't want braces. <laughs> and then I got the braces bro <laughs> and it was the most mortifying pain for the first two weeks because my teeth were apparently really messed up and the braces were strong. You can't eat any solid food. And if there's any solid stuff in your food, it's going to hurt your mouth so much. So I would just uh, get soup but every now and then the soup had certain meat pieces in it and if i would chew on that by accident my mouth would like sting in pain and for like two weeks i couldn't sleep it was like a headache uh, man that sucks yeah the pain really depends on how messed up your teeth is if it's just you need a little alignment then people can't empathize but if you have a teeth where you're <laughs> at your gums area it's going to be awful pain but after the two weeks are up harsh uh now the pain goes away but you need to adjust to the lifestyle you can't eat like popcorn for example or chew on gum because it's going to mess up your teeth and once a month or once every other month you need to get your braces tightened which was uh not something I was looking forward to because you're going to once again feel that pain for like a day or two so overall man uh i didn't like the braces experience too much it lasted for 2 to 3 years But nowadays teeth is uh, aligned it's looking good um but after you got to wear like it's a thing called retainers um a lot of people are at that point like man screw it i'm done with you guys i'm not going to wear the retainers and they just go back to living their lives wait so what happens if you don't wear the retainers well technically speaking like if a orthodont if you're telling your orthodontist friends that you don't wear your retainers they're going to scold you they're going to be like oh no your teeth is going to mess up again um I don't know man. I haven't worn retainers in 10 years. Uh the teeth still looking pretty good. Um but the retainers depend uh on like how messed up your teeth are. Some people have to wear it one year after the bra- braces come off. Some people have to wear it for up to 15 years. So What it really depends. What the fuck? Yeah. So now it and, and it just once again back to the perception thing. Like if you're going to get braces it's best to get it young yeah i know certain individuals that get braces when they're uh, 25 to 30 and you could just tell like it hurts their confidence like in pictures like before these were small like now they're small like like <laughs> like they, they no don't shit. feel com- they, they don't feel confident right i i knew this one girl named ekta who was a pr- like she was very photogenic and stuff but she got braces later on in her life and she would just like her body language was different like she just didn't feel confident in the braces uh, that's why invisalign is becoming very popular where it's sort of like braces but it's invisible so you can't see it you got to look really close be like wait a minute oh wait you got invisalign but you can't really see it especially in pictures and stuff ha huh, that's interesting wait how fucked up are people's teeth there Well, it's not just a matter of it being fucked up. It's like um certain people's teeth are really fucked up and it was like they, they were born into it being like all out of black. But certain people they just wanted to be straighter. So braces can do that for you. 
But nowadays, Invisalign market is definitely growing because, you know, people don't want like to tighten their braces and all of that stuff. It's a headache. It's expensive. I don't know, 15 years is crazy, though. 15 years is... Yeah, for retainers, yeah. I, I would just live with fucked up teeth, you know? <laughs> I'm like, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, some people, they just have to wear retainers when they're sleeping. I'm pretty sure that's what what I was supposed to do. Like, hey, wear retainers when you're sleeping. But, man, it just hurt, hurts your sleep, bro. Uh, I mean, this was when I was 16 or 17. Um. But don't, uh, whoever's listening to this, uh, don't listen, to, don't take this as advice. <laughs> if your orthodontist said, <laughs> wear the retainers, wear it. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So I used to have braces for a while. Glasses too. Wait, so this Invisalign thing you're telling me about, it's like braces, but it's invisible. Or is it less like fake teeth? The first one. It's like braces, but it's invisible. So why would anyone get regular braces? Well, so... In 2005, Invisalign was, it, it was like seen as a prop. It was actually seen as a joke. It's like <laughs> Invisalign, no, 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 I'm going to get braces, the real thing. And Invisalign wasn't taken seriously. But within the past six to seven years, Harsh, nowadays Invisalign is being taken seriously. So they're taking away a bunch of market share from the braces community. It's very similar to taxis and Ubers, where when Ubers were first becoming a thing, a lot of taxi drivers were scoffing at it. Where I know a lot of taxi drivers in New York, and a taxi driver has a different mindset than an Uber driver. A taxi driver, Harsh, views this as a career. Like they get um, their own car, they get health insurance, and all of that. And they viewed Uber drivers as props. Like, oh, you work when you want to. <laughs> You know, like they're scoffing at it. Easy piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> but within the past six to seven years, now Uber drivers are like taken seriously, right? And some of the taxi drivers I know up north, they operate like gangs. They're like, if an Uber driver comes in my block, bro, we'll scare them away. I'm like, your block? You sound like you're in a gang or something, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's very similar it's like nowadays uber is being taken more seriously invisalign is being taken more seriously it's, it's disruption man hmm. i get it i i think that a lot of these things right for example some people have to get their wisdom teeth removed and things like that mm -hmm. i think a lot of it comes down to the fact that we don't mm -hmm. eat a lot of hard food nowadays in the sense that people in the past, they didn't need braces. They didn't have to get wisdom tooth surgery as much. Right. And they had, if you look at archaeological archaeological records, you will find that they had much bigger jaws than we the, we have. And the airways were bigger and everything was bigger. But in the past 100 years or so, 200 years, we've been, eat, we've, we've been eating these industrial foods. Mm -hmm. We've been eating shit like, you know, cornflakes and soft stuff <laughs> yeah. and because of that our jaws have are getting smaller and smaller every generation and that's why these problems are cropping up that's an interesting theory here sh share the screen rule or click that image that i just shared screen on that's what invisalign is like ah uh -huh, yeah i've seen people wear this where the braces were trying to compete they had like one of these like um clearer braces looking thing but still like compare the difference between this and this this is what braces look like when I was wearing it. Like, um, so our orthodontist would be like whenever we'd go in for those like checkup sessions, harsh, they switch rubber bands. So a lot of the kids who had braces, they try to get creative with it. They'll be like, okay, what what rubber band color am I going to choose? So I would always choose um, red and green for Bangladesh flags, and some people would choose their colors. Like I don't know if you can tell from these pictures, like you get to choose the colors of your. Uh, like there's like little rubber bands here and when you're going to the orthodontist you're basically getting these removed and new ones installed but overall man like i would say the braces experience was a headache like one of the memories i still is ingrained in my mind is the day that i got my braces taken off <laughs> like I, I remember what i was wearing what i ate right after everything man <laughs> it was such a good uh, feeling but the but do you see from slavery. Yeah, but do you see it? Like, do you see Invisalign versus braces? The difference? The Invisalign stuff is superior. Yeah, absolutely. The whole braces thing, it makes you look like a 15-year-old. 
Yeah. Now imagine wearing that when you're a 28 year old man, or uh, like, what is that? Is that a man? 28 year old. Let's just put it like that. Yeah, a 28 year old dude wearing braces is not a good look. Or a 45 year old dude. Yeah, I think that's more of like the age to help you understand this. Yeah, I think at 45 you have to make peace with your you know physical features. You can't be like I'm gonna get braces done. It just it just doesn't fit, you know. It just it just looks like this is an immature dude here, <laughs> and he doesn't have to be immature. I'm just telling you the perception. Mm-hmm. For example, if someone looks at a 45 year old dude and he's wearing braces, his subconscious is gonna be like, okay, this guy is not as mature, or he's 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 gonna be childish. Yeah, it's because we associate braces with like teenagers, like 13, 14 year olds. Mm-hmm. That's so accurate, and it's the opposite with glasses. Where if you're a youngster wearing glasses. Adults yeah, who look, look at this like, kid and be like, this is the responsible one in the group. This is the responsible kid, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, man. I mean, okay, so you um, you wore glasses. You never wore braces. I'm trying to think if there's any other things that, like, a lot of people just have to go through. Did you ever, mm. did you ever have your ears pierced? No, man. Not no. yet. Never. Any tattoo? What about you? Any tattoo? Okay, no. so I did have one ear pierced before. And what happened was, it was a rash decision, which I don't recommend. I had the ear pierced. I, I go to this place called Claire's. Um, Claire's. And they do free ear piercings, okay? As long as you buy the earring from them. So I go there. Uh, and this was a craze back in the days. So I'm like to the lady, um, pierce my left ear. Because if you only pierce your right ear, Harsh, that's known as you being gay. That's like a signal, <laughs> apparently. So I was like, so I, I made sure of that. <laughs> I was like, make sure you pierce my left ear, lady. Don't make a mistake. And I kid you not, she's like, she's like analyzing my face. She's like, no, I don't think you will look good with just one earring. I will give you two. I was like, no, lady, just pierce my left <laughs> ear. And that's it. <laughs> and I kid you not, bro. So you getting your ears pierced nowadays is a very quick process. They have like a piercing gun. It's just, pachoo, pachoo, right? That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, and once they do, pachoo, they install the earring in you. So she did it for my left ear. I was like, nice. This looks good. And suddenly she just does it for my right ear too. Against my will. <laughs> I was like, hey, what the hell did you do? And I was like, uh, I was like about to yell at her. Then I look at the mirror. I was like, wait a minute. This actually looks pretty good. <laughs> 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 so it, it ended up looking pretty good. And um, I was getting some compliments on it. And what happens is if you take it out within the first week, then it's going to close up. Uh, mm-hmm. But you're supposed to leave it in the entire time for at least one week. And then you could just take it out willy nilly. By the fourth day, Harsh, I was just like, mm, no, nah, I'm not really willing to commit to this. And I just took it out. But yeah, um, I had, close back I had up. yeah, close back up. So I both had pierced ears for, yeah, both of them. So I had pierced ears for four days. Interesting. Did this scar? Not really. I mean, no one can even tell. Like if you like really Show touch. Show us your ears and mine. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, can't, you can't see anything. Um, this was a craze for a while. So um, I would say I was 19 at the time. Man, these crazes change so often that it's too risky to, you know, even think about them. For example, let's say today it's gay to get, you know, your right ears pierced. <laughs> so you get your left ear pierced and 20, year la- 20 years later, it's flips. Mm-hmm. So 20 years later, it's gay to get your left ear pierced. But your left <laughs> ear is already pierced. <laughs> man, um, and back to the perception thing, man, if you're a 35-year-old guy, a 40 year old and you have ears pierced i mean to a certain extent depending on the industry you won't be taken as seriously see definitely like, yeah if you're in the clubbing industry i mean people aren't even going to notice it because everyone has their ears pierced but if you're trying to work in the corporate life and you have like both ears pierced you look like a party dude uh same thing with hair like i used to have spikes and it's just like i was getting turned down for so many job opportunities when i had spikes versus the comb over because the comb over is just like seen as that competent style. See, it comes down to how well do you fit into the place you are at. For example, if you are working in finance mm-hmm. and 
you look like a party kid okay you have spiky hair tattoos on your body mm mm-hmm. is someone going to give you any money to manage <laughs> no no right you don't Hell fit the no. part so people judge you by your appearance and that's just a fact of life okay it doesn't have to be accurate in the sense some people will complain about it they'll be like hey just because i look like this doesn't mean i am like this i'm an extremely responsible person i just have ears pierced and i have a bunch of tattoos and you know you hear this stuff from women also you know yeah i i dress how i want doesn't mean i'm a slut i mean right. it's true but think about it if you found a catholic priest guy in a strip club what would you think <laughs> and this, this guy could just be man. there for any reason you know it's he could be like yeah just because i'm a catholic you know just because i'm wearing this catholic priest uniform doesn't mean i'm a catholic priest i'm just a random guy with this uniform at a strip club oh yeah But people assume you're a catholic mm-hmm. priest because you're wearing the clothes right so if you wear clothes that make you look irresponsible a party animal well that's how people are going to treat you as if i wear the clothes of a doctor people will assume i'm a doctor unless you know i provide evidence otherwise if i wear a policeman's uniform people will think i'm a policeman so if you wear you know the whole party person outfit people will think you're like a drunk party person who does drugs and probably can't be trusted with long term things mhm very accurate I wonder what else is there. I mean, we've already talked about a few with the braces, with the tattoos, hairstyle. I wonder what Do other Do you have any tattoos? No. That's one thing that uh I- I'm just not that's one thing I really think long term on. Like if I'm a 75-year-old man and I have a tattoo, I'm pretty sure it's not going to look good. It's going to look all wrinkly. So, no. Do you? No man, I don't have any tattoos. Did Wait, you ever want a tattoo? Are you allowed? To... No, I I do not. I think they look cool. Some of them look cool, but I just it seems like you know you have something clean, right? You have a temple and mm-hmm. then you took a piss on the side of the temple. That's what a tattoo <laughs> is. Like you, you ruined like a portion of your body. So I don't actually view it like that harsh. Uh, I I do think that some tattoos are very artistic and they have a lot of meaning where some tattoos like you, you'll see it like this I know this Puerto Rican his arm is covered in tattoos um and each one has this hidden symbolic meaning and that's why I see why tattoos have always been a thing throughout cultures where there's some sort of scarring that goes on and it's it's seen as a reminder but if you're just one of these people that are just getting any tattoo mindlessly that's idiotic for a while one of the craziest was you getting these uh uh asian hieroglyphic <laughs> symbols on <laughs> i know what you're getting at but go ahead <laughs> yeah so it was like this means um power right chicken <laughs> <laughs> Some people could really reach out and he was like that's not what it really means bro. <laughs> so you couldn't be certain like you couldn't even double check what what you're getting on your body really means. Like you got to know this stuff, man. Man, I've seen a lot of those really funny ones. You know, it says like, you know, idiot foreigner or cheese rolls and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> This means peace. Oh, no, sir, it means cheese rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if someone messes up your tattoo. Imagine if your tattoo artist was having a bad day and he just messes up your tattoo. I wonder if there's ever been a story like that. Probably has been. I think I think there's plenty of those stories, but I think you can cover it up, right? You can get like a bigger tattoo on it or get that tattoo removal thing. Yeah, yeah, you could uh, I heard tattoo removal, it's a it's a process. Like there was this one uh, Miss America uh, uh, contestant and she had like Uh, she got drunk one day and she got like this big tattoo of a well on her side and she was the spokeswoman for the tattoo removal industry she's like for the past 3 months this particular company has been helping me remove this big mistake that i made in my college years and i didn't invest enough time to watch the series of commercials but she was saying that it was a process it's not just you go in one day and it's removed you got to just keep going back and it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter and then one day it just disappears. Hmm, interesting. A tattoo it puts ink right under your skin, right? Yeah, it's like it pierces you. It's like a series of like boom 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 like uh, of you being pierced. 
So you got to have some f- insight when you're getting a tattoo. Like Some people's reasoning for getting a tattoo is like, oh, I was just bored. So why not? I was like, man, see, with the earrings, like, the earrings can close up if you feel like you made a mistake. But a tattoo, like, for the most part, it's with you permanently. See, I think that when you get when you get a visible tattoo, you have to be extremely serious about it. You have mm-hmm. to consider what repercussions it has down the line. For example, let me ask you, Arman, if you have the option of going to two doctors, and one doctor has like a face tattoo and one doctor doesn't. Which doctor are you going to prefer? The one without the face tattoo. Yeah, just how it is, you know, just how the world works. And mm-hmm. it might be unfair, but it is how it is. And uh, getting like a lot of visible tattoos just reduces your value in most sober places. So, yeah, you might look more thug, more, uh, what do you say, <laughs> street or whatever in clubs but in most sober circles you look like an idiot and it, it i don't mean that in a negative way but i mean like you just seem like an irresponsible person to most uh, normal people and mm. that's going to affect your career if you want to get a normal career see if you want to become a fitness influencer then you can get whatever you want you know you're your own boss but if you want like you want to become a lawyer or a doctor or something like that mm. then you have to maintain that persona you know like like I say, you can't be a Catholic priest and go to strip clubs at the same time. It just doesn't how it's not how it works. By the way, this analogy I got from this guy's book. This this is a guy called Charlie Munger, if you've heard of it. Mm-hmm. And he has the best analogies. <laughs> this guy's like, mm-hmm. you can't be a Catholic priest and go to a strip club. Like, yeah, you can't. <laughs> no. Charlie, uh, what is he? Isn't he almost 100? He looks like shit. Yeah, he's almost 100. <laughs> no, I'm just surprised because like him and uh, he's 99 years old. <laughs> just one more year. <laughs> like, when's his birthday? That's crazy, man. Um, when's his birthday? J- January 1st, 1924. So he just turned 99. Uh, Warren Buffett too, isn't he? Like 92. Yeah, he's 92. I heard uh, these guys, they have like no consideration for their diet. At least Warren Buffett, like he drinks Coke all the time, eats potato chips. Uh, How the hell is he up to 92? Uh, Still looking healthy. Either he's lying, which is my uh, estimation. I think he's just lying. Or he just doesn't give a shit. You know, you're 92. What's the worst that's going to happen? You know, (laughs) but apparently he's been doing this for a while. Like I I would assume that at this age, like some parts of his body would be breaking down if he hasn't been taking diet that seriously. Where I've, I've heard a lot of his interviews and he's just like, oh, man, like I can't live a life where I just eat salads and stuff like that. I just eat whatever I want. And I'm like, I don't really? think that's true. You I, don't, I don't think that's true? It. I don't believe it. Mm-hmm. I mean, if he is being honest, it's going to be like half a cup of, you know, Pepsi or Coca-Cola, what he's drinking and like a three, four chips or something like that. I don't think he just spends his entire day eating processed food. I think there's a big lie in it. Just, you know, just as a marketing aspect. See, if I can do it for 50 years, then it's not as bad. I I just think he's lying. You think he's lying? I think, I don't he's, think lying. he's lying. I don't think he's lying, dude. I think he's actually telling the truth. I don't think he puts that much um, emphasis on his diet. See, then why is he telling it to everybody? In the sense that, you know, this your diet is not something you tell everyone unless you are in this space of, you know, well, being, being an asked. influencer of some kind. Well, he's being asked in interviews, like, well, it's the typical day of Warren Buffett or the interviewer will ask, how did you make it this long? You must be like very health conscious. Like they'll ask him first and then he'll respond back. I don't know, man. It just doesn't pass the common sense filter for me. It actually. okay, bro. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of these billionaires, they're very quirky in some ways. Where did you ever hear of the Donald Trump diet? I have not. So he's not someone either that eats uh, healthy, does meal prepping, anything like that. Apparently, he's notoriously known for eating um, just fast food, specifically American fast food, like KFC, McDonald's, etc. And he goes by four to five hours of sleep. And this guy is, what, 76 years old, and he still looks pretty healthy. So I do think there's certain types of billionaires like Jeff Bezos, who's putting a lot of emphasis on his physique. But there's another set of billionaires that don't put that much focus at all, yet they have a very, very high energy. 
And I don't think they're lying. I don't buy it. I think these billionaires, they have these, they have a lot of cooks who chefs can and cook. Stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. chefs who can cook like tasty and healthy things at the same time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they might eat this, you know, American fast food every once in a while. But I just don't buy that they're consuming it on the consuming it on the regular. I think they make mm-hmm. it seem like they consume it a lot so that they are more relatable to the public, you know. For example, mm-hmm. Warren Buffett once said to this one guy that, okay, you eat McDonald's, I eat McDonald's, therefore we are the same. You know, w- what difference does money make? We eat the same food, you know. So they seem more relatable, but I think that's just a strategy mm-hmm. that the public likes you more if you're like them. You don't seem like a prick. You don't seem pompous. So yeah. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I could see that being the case, but I don't know, man. I mean, this is one of those things like we won't fully know, uh, but it is a quirk that I've noticed in a lot of high performers where one part of their life is not just shit. It's like shit, shit. Like it's really like, oh my goodness. Um, I've just noticed that with high performers where they focus so in on one thing that they completely neglect one or multiple parts of life. And Jordan Peterson was actually making a lecture about this where he was saying that that's the cost of being great, where a lot of individuals, like let's say you're let's say you're trying to make partner in the law firm, you're putting in 80 hour weeks, uh, then mathematically speaking, your family life or something is going to take a hit. So I've noticed like these inverse relationships in terms of a lot of high performers. That's true. That's true. Where if you're focusing too much on work, other things can take a hit. But I just don't buy the fact that these guys are still around at such like 95, eating crap for 40, 50 years straight. It just doesn't seem plausible. It it can be true. But like I said, it doesn't pass the common sense test for me. I think the alternative exp- explanation that I gave you makes way more sense and is more realistic where they Mm -hmm. just pretend to eat it so that they're more relatable to the public. The people don't hate them. And, you know, if if you take Warren Buffett, okay, what do most people know about Warren Buffett? They know that he's rich, he Mm -hmm. eats McDonald's, and then he drives a cheap car. Yeah. That's it, right? Yeah, he's a very strategic guy where he's not not just like this friendly grandpa. Like, he's he's smarter than he looks. Well, he looks pretty smart. Uh, well, one thing I've noticed with him, Harsh, is that he he's very into narratives where if you hear his interviews, he, he normally says, yeah, yeah, I invest in businesses that I know a lot about. But routinely, he puts in like, I invest in American businesses, um, which shows that that's something that he has a lot of pride for. But a lot of individuals don't pick that up. Like he'll say, like he'll specifically say, American businesses and like that's the narrative where it's like uh you know I'm really responsible for the capital allocation of American businesses and like you need some sort of narrative where like the general public they're just like looking at his investment strategies but they're completely ignoring the narrative side to him his interviews are very very insightful man like from a lot of these billionaires uh he gives a lot of wisdom I agree on that part mhm I think he has very good PR. He's a he's yeah. an insanely smart dude, of course. But you know regarding who, who, that diet okay. shit, it just seems like okay. a massive lie. Okay, okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I definitely can understand your case for that. And and what you're saying definitely makes more sense than what I'm saying. Like, health-wise, yeah. How, how the heck does he get to 92? But something in my gut just tells me that this dude really doesn't give a shit. I don't think he even goes to the gym. I, I don't think he's been going to the gym for. He's literally looked like an old man for the past forty years. <laughs> Have you heard of Morgan Freeman? Uh, he's the guy who who talks like this. Right? Yeah, dude. he has a good voice. Yeah, but what, ever since he was like twenty five, he looks exact same as he does at seventy five. <laughs> People are like, Morgan Freeman was just bo- born an old man. <laughs> A lot of people from China and all these like Oriental Asian countries have the same thing where you can't tell their age. For example, someone's like 35. Like I know this girl who's from Assam and she's a friend of mine and she not exactly a friend of mine, I just know her. But she, if you look at her pictures from like 10 years ago, she looks pretty much the same. You can't tell that she's aged 10 years in this process. 
So like they look I super that, young. Yeah, they look super young all the time. And it takes them, for example, like a 55 year old, a 45 year old, a 35 year old, and a 25 year old. It looks pretty similar in the sense that you just they they either age slower or we're not as good as telling them by their face. So we, we can't like tell, okay, this person is much older. Maybe mm-hmm. their own people can. Like if maybe a Chinese guy can differentiate between a 35-year-old and a 25-year-old Chinese girl. Mm-hmm. But for non-oriented people, it's just like harder to tell. At least I can't tell as well. Me either, man. We're, you're spot on with that. With Asian people, like I cannot tell at all. Not Asian, oriental. Asian includes Indian. Oriental. Different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my bad. Or, 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 yeah. I yeah. think they, they just hijack this word, you know. <laughs> Russians yeah, are also we, Asians. We, yeah, we just use that phrasing here. Like, it's just like when we say Asian, that just means oriental. Where yeah, because you guys are like so uppity about the whole racist thing. Where yeah, <laughs> yeah, have no. To take out India, Russia, <laughs> Middle East, Afghanistan, well, with, all these other places out of Asia, and just so we're with gonna, them, they're gonna, they're, they're, mean... they're just known as Daisy, or they're just known as Brown. No, 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 you you <laughs> yeah. triggered me now, man. You gotta go. <laughs> you need to let me finish my rant. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, R- rant away, my friend. So you've kicked all these people out of like, Asia, and you're still you're still using the word Oriental. But you're just saying Asian instead of it. So you still mean the Oriental people. You mean Japanese people, Vietnamese people, you know, Thai people, Korean people, Chinese people. And instead of saying Oriental, you're just calling them Asian and being like, okay, we're not racist. <laughs> <laughs> See, certain things, man, it's just so autopilot where you don't even know if you're offending someone hypothetically. Where if you do call someone that's, let's say, Japanese, Asian, here, like they'll just be like, "Hey, I'm Japanese. Uh, don't just call me Asian." Or, or, or you know, it, they want you to be specific. Where for a lot of people that don't mean any harm, it's just a figure of expression. Or with brown people, they'll just be like, "Oh, you're a brown guy," you know. Or they'll just say India. They, they're not going to say Pakistan, Bangladesh, anything like that. They're just going to be like India. But what? But with the Oriental people, harsh. There's this Chinese food place I go to. Every now and then, the guy just makes small talk with me. I'm thinking he's 28 years old. The man is 65. I'm like, bro, you are not 65. You literally look like a 28 year old guy. And he pulls out his driver's license. I still think he's lying. I'm like, man, what are you guys eating over there that allows you guys not to age at all? Daisies have That's the opposite thing. Right? Yeah, That's a good question. Yeah, Daisies have. Could be diet related. It could be diet related, man. Uh, the Daisies have the opposite problem, where <laughs> you're 25 and you look 35. Where, uh, uh, That's true. Yeah. Um, I have the opposite problem. Like I look really young. And you ever heard of ageism? I'm gonna guess it means discrimination based on age. Yes, and it normally is talked about for like older people where a lot of companies nowadays, like if you're uh, 55, they're just not going to hire you. They're going to be like, ah, this person can't be taught new stuff. So that's a traditional way ageism is used. The reverse is when you're too young or you look young and people in like, let's say in the public speaking field, that's where ageism hits. And they're so blatantly honest about it. Where when I was starting Armani Talks, I was like volunteering to do like free speeches in uh, the areas around me in different events. And they're like, well, how old are you? Uh, you look uh, you look like a 23-year-old kid. Like, w- what can you tell me? I'm like, what the hell? Because um, they're, they're like, this guy looks so young. Um, and they're like, the max that we can do is we can let you be a host. Like, we can't let you be a speaker because, well, what do you know? And, you know? And I'm just like, look at this guy, man. Like, this guy... Um, He is older, and the older you are in the public speaking field, the more respect that you get. But when you're a baby-faced guy, it's like, ugh, this guy can't teach me much. But doesn't that make sense in the sense, for like most cases, Mm -hmm. would you take life advice from a 16-year-old? I won't take life advice, but it depends on the context of the the explanations that you're giving so no but public... would you give them a chance in the sense that if some if a 16 year old was hosting some kind of conference would you go to it and the you know the topic of the conference was you know how to live your life or something like that no. and the guy see, 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 six... that's the topic so in a situation like that absolutely not but doing business in 21st century 
Absolutely. I'd be like, you I'd would, actually, I wouldn't. Yeah, okay. I, I would choose if someone is uh, very proficient in technology and let's say they're 25, I would trust them over someone that's 65. Now, is this right to no, say? No, but no. what about 25? You're making a, what's the thing? A straw man comparison, okay? Mm. What about a 25 year old and a 20 and a 15 year old? The topic is business in the 21st century. Who would you rather listen to? But that's a straw man too. Like, obviously I'm not going to, because it depends on the business advice that they're speaking about. So are we talking digital business? Sure. Uh, actually, let, 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 me, let me frame it differently. Let me frame it differently. Let's say that you are running some kind of speech platform and you get like a hundred applications a week. And mm -hmm. they're all supposed to be related to business. And, uh, you know, you don't have that much time to sift through someone's credentials as deeply. And you get a, you know, thing from like a 21 year old. and But most of the stuff you're getting are from like 30, 40 year olds. So you get like one outlier, 22, 21 year old, you're going to discard it, right? Most people would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, I get your general thing where you're saying for life advice, the older, the better. But with public speaking, not all, like all of these conferences and stuff are regarding motivation, inspiration and such. Certain conferences and such have different themes. Like certain things are like, how can you inspire? Um, how can you inspire in this context? For those situations, I'd be like someone within 55, 65, for sure. But if you're talking about business nowadays, I'm not just going to be like, okay, this guy's 55, so I'm going to listen to him over the 25-year-old businessman because the complexity is different. Um, but what happened, Harsh, was they'll be like, oh, no, no, you, you're too young. But what happens is that anyone that wants to do any kind of public speaking, start off as the host. Because if you can be the host where you're the glue guy, and the speakers are the depth guys, harsh. Um, mm -hmm. The more that you're the glue guy, people see like, oh, okay, like this guy actually knows what he's talking about. And then they'll be like, hey, how about you give a speech? And that's how you progress up. But nowadays, man, like if you could have a body of work just with content, like people can really see what you're about and they'll approach you. So that's content is a business card nowadays. That's interesting. Do people actually go and listen to public speeches nowadays? I have never been to one. Dude, so this is where the industry has changed so much. In 2019, there was this very famous public speaker that lives uh, 30 minutes away from me. And he was actually my public speaking mentor for a while. Very well known here. He even used to like do conferences with guys like Tony Robbins and stuff. And when he would throw an event, multiple people would come. Right, Harsh? And from all the people that would come, like multiple people would work with him and he charges high fees, like uh, uh, like a lot of like political leaders and stuff come to him. Then coronavirus happens. And during the coronavirus thing, like he was still mentoring me. I was like, yo, you should invest in YouTube and stuff. And he was like, YouTube, like I'm a, do you know who I am? Like I'm a, the public speaking a guy. He's talking all like that. Then the whole social distancing, all of that stuff happened. A lot of events got shut down. And then he was just like, hey, man, uh, how do I upload a YouTube video? <laughs> oh, so, man. Oh, so he's, man. <laughs> so he's feeling it. He's just like, mm, something's changing. And after the coronavirus, man, a lot of people who would just throw these live events, they've had to reevaluate their business model. Number one, a, a lot of people aren't going to these speeches, like you said. And number two, a lot of people don't want to learn public speaking like before. They would much rather learn how to talk in front of a camera, podcast, and such. Public speaking is becoming more of a um, situational act versus then versus a lifestyle act. A situational act as in the best man speeches, people want a public speaking coach, but people don't just want to learn public speaking for a career aspect nowadays. That, that's something that I've just noticed. Yeah, I don't think you could make much of a career as a public speaker nowadays because people just watch stuff on YouTube. Like no one yeah. pays and goes to watch a public speech. At least I've never done that. I, I really doubt I ever will. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I've heard of this guy. His name is Tony Robbins, if you've heard of him, mm -hmm. who's supposed to be a very successful public speaker. Yeah. But never cared, never listened to anything by him. And 
I think a lot of these business models are just like made for the past generation and the current generation doesn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. Where that one event where, you know, like I was saying the ageism was going on, like I was in there and they were like, like a lot of them were saying, yeah, if you want uh, like to succeed in the modern day business, you print out these business cards, you, um, you, you know, you get a, a press kit. <laughs> this is a, this is like a really big phrasing in 2005 like a press kit um you uh, like get your name out into to the newspapers i'm like dang man like this guy is giving such outdated advice like <laughs> like this is one of those situations where i'm like i could actually share a stage with these guys because the context of the speech it's um it's it it doesn't matter if you have a lot of age it's not necessarily relative to the topic but yeah i mean in certain feels harsh like if you look young it's going to be ageist. I don't really care, by the way. I, it's just like, you got to be realistic. Like, back to one of the examples you said, where, you know, if you, like, dress all skanky and someone's like, oh, man, like, this girl must be down. And it's like, well, wh why are you judging me by what I'm wearing? It's like, objectively speaking, the masses are going to judge you. It doesn't matter which field you're in. There's always these judgments that go around. Yeah, man. About the ageism thing, though, I do think it's unfortunate for older people because, you know, when you're older, you need the money more mm -hmm. and you can't find a good job because you're older. That's... So you get screwed. You get screwed. Yeah, but I get man. the company's perspective as well because it makes sense. It, it might not be true for everybody. But for example, if you take a company, they're hiring an employee. They would like the employee to be around for, say, 10 years. But if someone's 56, then they're going to retire in four years. And to top it off, now, if they retire at your company, you have to give them some kind of retirement money and you have to pay them some pension and shit like that. Mm -hmm. So not only did you not get to keep the employee for a while, you had to pay them more because they're, they're more expensive because they must have more experience or, you know, higher demands. They they only stayed with the company for a small amount of time. And then you had to pay them even more money at retirement. Mm. So for the company, it seems like a bad deal. So have I you get ever hired? Mm -hmm. I have never hired an old person. Not because I was being ageist. It's just that I just hadn't had. I just I just don't have any positions open that require as much experience. Mm. But a small company, Arman. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, I, and would you like if they had um a lot of the like the qualities that you were expecting, or would you just be like, ah, eh, now I'm looking for more long term investment? I wouldn't mind hiring an older person. The only issue is that, see, I'm 27 right now. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be weird for an old person who's like 57 to like listen to what I say and then do it. Mm. In the sense that, you know, if I'm like in the boss's cabin and he's sitting outside with the other 25, 24 year old employees, it's going to be weird for him, right? <laughs> you think so? so? I, yeah, it's going to be weird for him for sure. Yeah. And so, so I doubt he would want to work with us. It, it, it's just an awkward thing, you know, when you're at that age, you expect respect from youngsters and you don't expect like a 27 year old to be your boss. And it's just going to be like a very awkward, humiliating experience for an older person. Just, just mm. being like realistic here. I know these people care about these things a lot because I used to work with some of these bigger companies back when I was a consultant. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact, I know a couple of employees would leave these companies because they would have like a senior who was significantly younger than them. So you would have a 30 year old being managed by a 22 year old and the 30 year old would just quit his job after a couple of months. He's like, okay, and there's nothing wrong with this 22 year old, but my ego just can't take it. Like, I don't want to be listening to some guy who's so much younger. It's bothering me too much. So I'm leaving. Hmm. That. That's something I, I haven't considered because I, I do have one gentleman who's like a much older that technically works for me. Uh, and every now and then, like, you know, he, he's Moroccan, uh, but he, he's not like a 40 hour a week worker. It's project by project sort of worker. But I wonder if he's ever considered that. See, I think it's different when it's project by project, right? Because at that point, you're not his boss. Yeah, I'm not his boss. You're yeah, like that's, a client. That's a yeah it's more so a client um yeah and moroccans normally have like this very uh, aggressive tone like they're very good at what they do but like 
they'll they have these piercing words or they'll sometimes write in all caps like whoa whoa bro <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah i mean I, I, maybe it's because of the moroccan culture and a mix of um it's just project by project but there's never been man I, like this guy that's significantly younger than me is telling me how to do my job so yeah i, I mean that could definitely be a thing even on a subconscious level it's definitely a thing. I know for a fact, I know people who have left their jobs because of this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's some guy who's just a graduate and he's being managed by some, you know, qualified professional who's like 10, 15 years younger than him. Yeah. He just eats them up inside. Just, they can't handle it. People, people have egos. You just have to ha accept the fact. And uh, yeah, they, they'll quit their job over it. Wow. There's another like remix where let's say a woman is making way more than a guy in a relationship. And by the way, I don't have any evidence. Like these are just from the shows that every now and then I watch where a lot of these uh, successful women will be like, man, my husband like just started to act out later on in our relationship. And I wonder if it's a similar dynamic with the, you know, the boss being way younger than the worker. I wonder if it's a similar dynamic that's happening in relationships as well. I think f women would, I don't know, I, I would, I'm just guessing here because I've never been in a relationship where the girl made more money than me. But uh, from what I understand, women would generally respect a guy who makes less money, like, less than a guy who makes more money. In the sense that if you make less money than the, than the woman, then technically she's the breadwinner of the house and you would get less respect. But mm. if you can find, like, if you can maintain a normal relationship where the woman makes more money than you, I don't see an issue with that. In a sense that I would not consider it to be a bad thing if a woman that I was dating made more money than me. Like, cool, you make more money. That's awesome. Pay for mm. shit. Yeah. It'd be a problem <laughs> if she's... Uh, <laughs> pay for shit. <laughs> It'll be a problem if she's, like, throwing it in your face, like, when you guys are in an argument. Yeah, see... I think that's a problem. Even if you're a guy and you're throwing it in a girl's face, okay, I make more yeah. money. You to listen to me. That's, yeah. that's not the right thing to do, right? Whenever is someone, or the money brings out certain dark parts of human nature. Where at times people think it's just like uh, this thing for transactions, harsh. But other times mm -hmm. it becomes this power dynamic where you won't notice that they consider it a power dynamic until someone's angry at you. It's like I'm paying for this project and you do as I say. It's like, oh, okay, you know, and now the money is coming up. But um, one of the leading causes of divorce from statistics is due to disagreements with something money related. That's what I read. Could be, could be, man. I, I do think that if you can get a woman who makes a lot of money, you should be fine as long as you're masculine enough and can handle it. Mm -hmm. But if you're like a you know, you're like a beta male, then it's not going to end well for you. Mm. Did you, so you any... got a... mm -hmm. go ahead. Did you ever have any disagreements with money? Like not only in relationships, but partnerships or anything like that? Not really. Never had a disagreement related to money in any relationship or in partnerships. In a lot of relationships, I just, in a lot of relationships I've been in, sometimes I just pretended to be broke just to see what happens. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, what happened? Got... Nothing. The girl just pays for stuff. It's fine. <laughs> okay. You have that masculine presence. I don't know about the masculine presence stuff. So even like when I was like 21, 22 years old and I would go out with a chick and mm. I would not tell them what I did. Like I would just tell them, okay, I'm studying or whatever. And they had a job. They just pay for shit. You know, it's fine. You know, they they pay for like a nice dinner. We'll just go to her place instead of mine. And so, you know, you know, because it's cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. so to go to someone's place than to like say go to go to a club or something. So they would just pay for it. It's not a big deal. Was um, it for a series or was it like every now and then? You know, they pay and then you you'd go back to paying, or did you just there was let this them pay one for girl series? who always paid. She was a good girl. Hmm. But uh, yeah, I haven't done that lately because I just think that, you know, this was back when I was like 21, 22, 23, right? Mm -hmm. But now as like 20, at 27, I'm, if I go out with a girl, she's going to be like 22 herself. It just, it just doesn't feel right to make a 22-year-old pay for me. 
you know, it's just like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and plus, you know, if you depend on a 22 year old's budget, you can't really go anywhere for good. So, right. So now I just pay for whatever I want. Never had a disagreement related to money in business, also. I, I think I'm a fair guy and I hold on to my end of the deal. And typically, you clarify everything, flesh it out, do a contract or some kind of written agreement, mm -hmm. and you should be good. So no real disagreements related to money in business, mm -hmm. but I, I, I am a chartered accountant, right? And as I told you, most disagreements related to money comes where, come when there's like a big disparity. For example, let's say that you have two business partners and you're both working on the business, but one guy owns 90% and the other guy owns 10%. That's like a recipe for a business disagreement coming up mm -hmm. because it's fine when the business is making like, a thousand two thousand dollars a month but if your business is making like a hundred grand a month and one guy is taking in like 90k and the other guy only gets 10k mm -hmm. there's gonna be problems the second guy is not he's not gonna work at all he's gonna be like fuck this shit i'm not i'm out this oh yeah fair. and other times when it's uh let's say a 50 50 pay cut and one person is doing way more work than the other person they're like well why are we getting 50 50 you barely do any work so that's when another disagreement brews you had that thing happen to you once, didn't you? Yeah, well, there was this like there was this one time where, yeah, uh, like long story short, it was a Craigslist business. This guy was um, getting fifty percent of the money uh, for like the, the flipping business, but he wasn't putting in any work. I was like, bro, we're gonna have to reevaluate the the percentage structure. And luckily, like we didn't have a like a falling out or anything. But he was just like, wait, what? I'm not going to get fifty percent for just sitting on my ass. I was like, no, my friend, <laughs> we're going to have to switch it to like 60, 40 or something. Um, so it was reasonable and it worked out. But other times people are going to be like, mm -mm, I'm going to keep 50, 50 like we agreed on. I mean, that's why um, like the story of McDonald's, Harsh, where mm -hmm. Ro uh, was it Ray Kroc, uh, he was the guy who was responsible for making McDonald's like this global franchise. But the McDonald's brothers were the one who initially had the proof of concept. So what in what happened was Ray Kroc came to the McDonald's brothers and was like, I'll make your thing global. McDonald's brothers said, sure, 50-50, something like that. But as more time started to go on by, Ray Kroc was putting in a lot of work. The whole process of expanding, franchising and stuff, I mean, he was pretty much pioneering it. And the McDonald's brothers were just sitting on their butt doing nothing. So that's where the disagreement happened. So the story of McDonald's, like those two ended up hating each other at the end but that's what happens when you're getting 50 50 and one person is putting in way more work then it's going to be like mm, what gives so what came of it what did what happened later with the whole well, mcdonald's thing yeah well ray crock ended up i believe buying out their shares so he was predominantly responsible for it but a lot of individuals think that ray crock was the guy who thought of mcdonald's he was not. He was the guy who was responsible for the franchising and creating processes. So it could actually be a business. But the McDonald's brothers created McDonald's in San Bernardino, California, and they had the proof of concept. So they created the idea. Ray Kroc expanded it. And at the end, Ray Kroc had predominant shares because he bought out the McDonald's brothers. Man, how often do you go to McDonald's? I used to go a lot, man. But nowadays, with the prices increase, like there's no such thing as a, a value menu anymore. It's like you pretty much... Uh, you, before, I would go to McDonald's for the, the cost. But nowadays, it's not even that cheap. So I just go elsewhere. You? Uh, interesting. I go to McDonald's every time I go trekking. And I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. I'm a guy. I'm 90 kilos. And I sweat a lot. In the sense, I don't know if it's hyperactive sweat glands or something, but even if I stand in the sun for 20 minutes, I'll be drenched in sweat. I sweat a lot, and sometimes I'll trek like eight hours, nine hours a day. And what happens is that if you sweat a lot, you're losing a lot of salts in your body, and you get cramps. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is you have to drink electrolyte powder. And I found a way to get a lot of salt in your body really quickly. It's to carry two or three McDonald's burgers up with you while trekking and just have them. And I'll tell you why McDonald's burgers in particular. 
Firstly, McDonald's doesn't spoil. So if you're trekking, you're not in the cleanest environment, right? Sometimes you're crossing a river and sometimes it's raining and your food is not going to stay the cleanest. And you can trust McDonald's to put enough preservatives in their food that it's still going to be safe to eat. <laughs> so first that, okay, it doesn't spoil. Secondly, have you seen the Alu Tiki burger? It's really good. Like it tastes really good. And it's not super, what do you say? It's not, it's not very greasy. So if you keep it in your backpack and even if it gets squeezed on a little bit, mm-hmm. it doesn't break and become mashy. It, it still retains, it's, it's still a burger when you open the packet up after six hours. So it, it's something that you can eat and it it, does, it stays like food. You know, if you, if you take something else, either you have to take it in a Tupperware, which adds weight to your trek. But if you mm-hmm. take it in the polythene, it just gets squeezed up, right? If you take bananas, it'll become banana paste. You're right. But the burger stays how it is. And it has so much salt in it that if you have the burger when you're up at the top of the mountain, it just doesn't, it prevents you from cramping by a lot. Mm. So I have McDonald's every time I go trekking. It's almost like a religious thing now. Like if I'm going trekking, okay, I'm going to get two, three alotikis up with me. Mm-hmm. And you know, if I'm going trekking with someone, we're gonna share. So we'll have like one or two alotikis each. Is, is this something? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. It's the only thing I eat from McDonald's: the alu tiki burger, <laughs> and only while trekking. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, are other people aware of this, or is this something that pretty much works for you? Where it I works heard, for me. Mm-hmm. I heard about people eating ice cream after working out. Like, is this one of those things, or is it one of those like it, it really works for you along with a lot of other people as well? Because I could see it working well it works for me in the sense earlier when i would go trek for like two three days and i would come back i would take like four days to recover in the sense i know that i was tired i would just my feet would just cramp a lot like my quads if i would walk my quads would tighten up at every step it it was really painful Mm -hmm. and i looked into what was causing it and turns out it's like a salt imbalance you've lost so much salt while trekking because you're sweating so much for days on end Mm-hmm. so you have to replenish your body with salts and what the solutions i found was to drink electrolyte powder across the trek and to eat these mcdonald's burgers and i don't get cramps anymore while trekking so it works did you also try gatorade i didn't try gatorade i don't carry liquids up while trekking it just adds weight i see what you're saying man what you're saying actually makes sense because there was one time I went hiking. I, I don't go hiking too much, but afterwards, man, I was starving. And the closest thing was a McDonald's. And once I ate it, it just, it felt like my body just absorbed it. And it's just like, I, I had energy right after. So I, I don't know if there's like, it was because of the salt imbalance and stuff, but I've noticed something similar as well. It makes a big difference. The whole cleanliness aspect also is very useful. You know, when mm-hmm. you're on a hike, you're getting wet and, the food inside your backpack might get contaminated. Mm. So you don't and, like meal prep and like, did you ever try meal prepping and taking the meals with you or now you just do the fast food route? No, you, you can meal prep if you want, but you know, your fresh home meal is not going to survive seven, eight hours or even like 24 hours. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's, it's not going to stay edible. And if it starts, if it starts, say, having some kind of bacteria grow in it and you get sick on a hike, you're fucked. Imagine, like, climbing 8 to 12 hours down if you have diarrhea. That's not going to be a fun experience. <laughs> so you want something that's not going to get you sick. So McDonald's seems like the perfect food. I've been using it quite a bit. So, yeah, McDonald's works for me. Other than tracking, do you eat McDonald's or fast food in general? Or do you stay away from it? The only fast food I would eat is Subway. Mm, and I Subway, Subway. I try to make it yeah I, I love Subway too I make it as healthy as possible so it's not unhealthy for me mm-hmm. I just have the multigrain bread all the veggies no sauces except the red chili sauce and the entire thing is maybe 350 calories and it's not unhealthy because I haven't put any oil mayonnaise and all that bullshit on it so it's just mm. red chili sauce all the veggies and that's it you guys got red chili sauce you guys yeah, are so lucky the- See, we don't have that <laughs> here, man. <laughs> I went to order Indian food recently, and I'm like, yes, ma'am, uh, chicken biryani, extra spicy. She's like, sir, sorry, we don't do spicy. 
I'm like, what? You don't do spicy? I was like, what kind of Indian restaurant is this? <laughs> Hang up. <laughs> <laughs> We don't do See, spicy. <laughs> what probably the? because people must have had negative experiences, you know. Like yeah. Indian version of spicy is probably extra extra spicy for you guys. Well, what I noticed here Harsh is that it's one or the other. It's like they don't do spicy or if they do it spicy, they'll ask you. They'll be like, "If you say I, I would like it extra spicy, they're like, are you sure?" And like they'll always ask you that. Are you sure? <laughs> and if you're someone that eats spicy, you're like, you know, you have a chest out, you're like, "Yeah, I'm sure." And then they give it to you and you're like, <laughs> "Whoa, man, it's like <laughs> they weren't joking." <laughs> <laughs> man, I love spicy food. What about you? I love spicy food, man. It was a subconscious thing because when I was growing up, my dad would eat a lot of these like morich. You know what morich is? Is that what you guys call it? Never heard of it. Okay, morich is like the green peppers. Like he just eat it while oh, okay, eating okay. pot. Okay, mitchy, mitchy. Okay. Mitchy, okay. And I just thought that was cool. And my, my dad was like if if you eat spicy, it's good for the heart. And my brother like started to eat really spicy and then me and him would compete on who could eat spicier <laughs> dude he wins like he could like he like you know he eats so spicy man i'm like man now it's just too much like i don't think anyone can take him hand for hand in terms of spicy he does these like wings eating competitions like in pennsylvania every now and then i'm like you're in a league of your own but spicy was something that i grew into where before i didn't like it but nowadays like the food doesn't have flavor without it are you like that exactly yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah i i know what you mean so have you had continental food it sucks what's that oh, I, i may know what it is but under a different name so it's like you know the bland noodles and shit like that let me show uh, you uh yeah no i know what you're talking about i know what you're talking about like it's bullshit like who eats this crap so mashed potatoes like come on man like, oh, come on I, i i actually like mashed potatoes you have to be in the mood for it though um but i could see why like someone like that's used to spicy will hate stuff like mashed potatoes like noodles and stuff like that yeah i like food that has like i don't know what like, mirchi you know masala that hona chahiye khana it it has to be have masala in it it so, needs a flavor yes yes i need to have that zesty thingness on on your tongue and i think a lot of these western foods they just don't know how to put the right amount of chili on it Mm-hmm. And when they do, they don't get like which chili to use. They'll put like green pepper on it. Like who puts green pepper to spice something up? Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> I once took one of my white friends to an Indian spot, and like they had like ketchup at at one point, like just like one of the condiments. And he's like eating uh, the ketchup, and he's just like, "Who tangy?" I'm like, "Oh <laughs> my man, bro, you definitely can't eat anything spicy here." and this is why you don't also want to trust the reviews for a lot of these places a lot of like people that aren't used to spicy will leave one star reviews at these indian spots that do cook spicy like it almost burned my tongue off and uh, like it's so misleading like for sometimes like you'll see the indian spot here it's like a 3.7 rating and you're like oh man like what did they do wrong and then one day like you'll just go there because there's nothing else open you'll go and the food is amazing and then you'll read the you'll actually read the reviews rather than just see the 3.7 and you're like oh man these guys are complaining about it being spicy like that's a five star for me <laughs> so man, you can always trust you, you can always trust the reviews here so this is this stuff is one of my favorite foods okay i i know what you mean these people like you know it's like going to the strip club and being like hey uh, I wasn't expecting people to get naked. Like you went to a spicy food <laughs> restaurant, you ordered spicy food. <laughs> like I'm a Catholic priest, why are people getting naked here? Like so, you came here. <laughs> You're the one who came here, man. This okay? You show me something. Ooh, so this stuff. Is... So it's like it's a it's chutney made out of red chilies, mm-hmm. and it's really really tasty. It's spicy, mm-hmm. but it's tasty. and i doubt westerners can handle this no nah, no nah. see the western taste bud harsh like you know how you're saying that mashed potatoes noodles they're very bland have you had this what is that masala that... omelet oh yeah my mom makes that a lot and that's paratha no it's not a paratha it's omelet no no the thing on the side next to the lemon yeah, yeah. i think so so Are you like you're getting the... me hungry bro 
You know I do it bad. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I like red chili a lot. Like when it's when it's really. Have you had garam masala? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That well, stuff also tastes really yeah. good. Yeah. So do you Indian know how to cook are, that stuff? Like yeah, cook Indian food. Mm-hmm. I can cook a lot of Indian foods. I can't make roti properly. Like you, you can't get it round from me. Mm-hmm. To be honest, I have. I don't cook that much, right? I have a cook, so yeah, I don't cook. do cooking. Mm-hmm. But I can cook if things get to it. Yeah. I just think it's like a waste of time, you know, to like go prepare. Like who, who does that? What guy wants to spend his time cooking? Right. No, the reason I ask her is because for a long time, like the food just showed up for you and there was a period where um i wanted to understand how to cook it i'd like watch my mom and i'm like man this is a process like it's like a bunch of stuff you have to do in order to get the meal ready and i recall when i was a little kid like i used to like whenever my mom would make uh bright like in bengali food i'm like ah oh, man i wanted macaroni and cheese or mcdonald's and my mom was like when you grow up you're going to appreciate this food and dude when i was in college that's when I like some of the food there, bro. Like if you're over here in college, you're basically getting a student dining halls. It's, it's like the same thing all the time. So whenever I'm going home, I'm like, yes, I'm going to be eating some Bengali food. So my mom ended up being right. She's like, you'll appreciate the food once you're older. I agree. I think you appreciate things when they're taken away, but I definitely know what you mean. I'll, I'll give you mm-hmm. another example. And I think you're hundred percent right. Mm-hmm. Back when I was a kid, right, I would love chocolate, and I would. I, I used to think that who eats sweets? You know, you, you've seen those Indian sweets, right? Katli and laddu mm-hmm. and everything. Yeah, laddu. <laughs> who eats sweets? You know, everyone eats, you know, chocolate. And now at my age, I'm like, I hate chocolate. It's just too sweet. It just doesn't. It just tastes the same. Mm-hmm. It has no f- flavor outside of its sweetness. And I love Indian sweets. I like katli, and you know it has like different different tastes. Laddu has a different taste, and I, I just really like it. Gajar ka halwa. You like uh, jalebi? Jalebi is one particular thing I don't eat. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I like the taste, but the the thing is just sugar cooked in oil. Mm-hmm. So there's unhealthy, and there is fuck you. I'm trying to die unhealthy. <laughs> right, right. And right, right. jalebi is there. You know, it's just like sugar cooked in oil. Like who eats that? It's crap. It's like a donut but, on crack. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. But I will eat the healthier Indian sweets. You know, if you have katli, just it's a small amount of sugar. But if you get the guy to make it, he's gonna put mostly cashew, that's cashews, and a very very small amount of sugar. So the texture of it is really good and doesn't have much chocolate in it. So you can also have things like you know, moong dal ka halwa if you've had it. It also tastes really good. Hmm. So I like Indian sweets a lot more now that I'm older. It has this has better taste, but back as a kid, I just like chocolate more. Right, like you need a certain time to like be exposed to it. Then you need to grow apart from it for you to just come back and be like, okay, and I, now I see what the hype is about. Yeah, I I think so. I think you're right. Uh, so you that that really does happen. You know, you kind of grow into your culture after a, after a certain age. Right. Do you guys have like buffets over there? Is that a concept? Yeah, it, it's a concept, but it kind of gets ruined as you get older. Mm-hmm. So when you're young, right? When you're, say, eight years old, you love going to buffets because you get to eat whatever you want, whatever quantities you want, and you get like a variety of dishes. Mm-hmm. But once you went to slightly older right? at my age I, I have so much money i don't even give a shit about it so if i want a buffet i just order or i just go to a buffet place mm-hmm. i don't need a wedding or some occasion to get a buffet right and when i do go to buffets i'll just go to like a good place and the food is gonna be really really good mm-hmm. so when you go to a wedding you get food from like a mass caterer right and the food is not gonna be up to the type of food that you're used to eating now mm-hmm. so Earlier, as a kid, buffet was associated with, okay, lots of food, unlimited variety, and lots of fun. And now, when I think of buffet at a wedding, it's like, okay, so subpar quality. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's a concept where, for a while, 
uh, my dad, anytime we'd want to go to buffets, my dad's like, ugh, gina lage, which means like, the, the, I'm disgusted yeah, by it. He doesn't like it. I'm disgusted by it. Yes. And I didn't get it. I'm like, don't you see that? Like, there's so much food. You could just eat unlimited food. And as an adult, I went to a buffet recently and I see this dude just like coughing very liberally around the food. I'm like, bro, can you turn around and like <laughs> not be around the food? And it just, I was like, ugh, kina lage. Like, I was disgusted too. <laughs> um, and I just got it. And I was like, man, I would just rather go to go for the experience. Do you like buffets though? I did, but nowadays, I, I mean, I can't even recall the last time I went. Like over here, we have Golden Corral, CC's Pizza, uh, Oyster Catchers, and stuff. Where these are pretty popular buffets, but it just attracts a group of people that I don't know if I want to be in the same vicinity with when they're eating, mm. <laughs> like just coughing and stuff. I'm like, man, turn around, man. Um, so one interesting and like weird fact that I'm sure both of us have in regards to each other. Here's mine is for a while i was hardcore into it, it's a sport harsh it, it's called professional eating have you heard of it no so tell me about professional eating competitions so professional eaters um there was like this one guy that got me hooked on the sport his name was takiro kobayashi he was this very sh uh, uh, like short chinese man that was ripped and whenever you're picturing a professional eater you're picturing someone that's fat most likely right like this mm -hmm. guy eats for a living but here is this asian guy that's just ripped let me just show you a picture of him just to uh give you more context um and as i like saw like they made a documentary on him hold on let me just show you him first oh this guy he does not look like a professional eater right and i just got hooked i was just like whoa you, you could be like that ripped and eat whatever you want and for the next couple of days i'm like trying to be like this guy i'm buying all these hot dogs and i'm like trying to eat it eating the burritos like in a very quick rate i'm timing myself and they made this documentary on him to see how he trains to be a professional eater and buffets would fear him <laughs> they'll be like oh man like he's coming because that's where he would go train that was like his gym and that's initially how the idea got planted in my mind on like going to buffets like i would initially go in not to just enjoy myself but I was going there to train harsh to uh, be uh, to do some professional eating. How much weight did you gain? I, so I had a really fast metabolism. So I was like this guy. That's why I resonated with him. I didn't gain any weight uh, because your stomach can just eat so much food. It was like, all right, um, if you're serious about this, you got to keep doing it. Otherwise, your stomach's not going to expand. Uh, I lost my dreams of being a professional eater after a couple of days, <laughs> but it, it was. Uh, it was a very big craze for a while, specifically in 2007. So you never competed, basically? I never competed, no. It was just the idea of eating food really fast. Would you compete in a food eating competition? Mm, maybe just to get free food, but... Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I eat it real slow. <laughs> yeah, I'm, they're like, come on, your last place. I'm like, yeah, yeah, go, it's all good. <laughs> nah, nah, I probably wouldn't. There was this one video of him going up against a grizzly bear. Who, uh, and uh, who could eat hot dogs faster? Who do you think won? Or did I ask you this question already? You haven't, but uh, it. I think the grizzly bear, assuming the grizzly bear was hungry. Yeah, the grizzly bear ended up winning. So, because I was always curious, like, how do these guys make money? Like, they're centering their lives on being a professional eater. There's no leagues on professional eating. So they do a lot of these uh, local competitions uh, of restaurants that are trying to launch their restaurant. They're like, famous uh, eater Takeru Kobayashi is going to come and try our gourmet food. So that's one way. Uh, another way is they do a lot of these like freak activities, like going up against a bear to see who, who could eat faster. Uh, so they sign TV sponsorship deals. And um, I, I don't really know the ceiling that you can have in terms of being a professional eater. So they're like clowns. Yeah. Uh, like if you're going to say if someone's a clown, like I'm pretty like sure they animals, you know, like... Yeah. I see. I see. Man, so... being a professional eater, like I don't know. I don't know what you think about it. Like I, I, on one hand, I get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to do something to survive. But yeah. <laughs> from all career choices, eating is not like the most 
<laughs> so this Takeru Kobayashi mm-hmm. guy was the reigning champ, and he just blew the uh, uh, blew everyone away because they're like, for the longest time, if you were a professional eater, you were this husky dude, and here's this random ripped guy, Asian guy that just comes out of nowhere, and he just obliterates the competition. So he's like a star for the next couple of years, and then a few more years come goes on by harsh. And there's this guy named Joey Chestnut. And Joey Chestnut obliterates Takeru Kobayashi's record. And he just makes Takeru completely irrelevant. Like this Asian guy ended up becoming very weird after losing like that. Because it hit his ego hard. Because when you're like the dominant champ and someone just obliterates your record, you start to question your identity. So nowadays, um, whenever people are talking about professional eating, it's Joey Chestnut that's seen as the, the champion. One commentator got carried away one time. And he's like, Joey Chestnut is the greatest athlete of all time. And someone's like, all right, buddy, <laughs> settle down. Because <laughs> <laughs> technically, he's the greatest in his sport. But it's just difficult to frame someone who dominates sport as the greatest athlete. <laughs> Would you consider it a, consider it a sport, though, eating? Uh, from the outside, it doesn't seem like it. But from the inside, there's a lot of training that goes in it. They did a sports science uh, episode on it where, like, how you have to eat. You can't just eat it like this. You got to, like, like train your neck in a certain way to make sure the food's going smoothly rather than choppy. You got to wiggle your stomach in certain ways. Uh, so I would consider it a sport. If we're considering NASCAR a sport or, like, professional driving, I would say professional eating is definitely a sport. Because it's stressing your body out. And you can actually die from it. Yeah, I've heard of water poisoning, where you drink too much water and you die. Mm-hmm. Now that's, a, that's a competition too, Harsh. Who could drink more water? I think people just do dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> to get in a sport like this, you either have to be super passionate or there has to be some money involved. I, I don't know, like, let me see how much... Joey Chestnut, like, how much he makes. If they will. Let me see. That's 2.5 million. Ha, huh, not bad. Yeah, because the thing is, like, the most famous one is called the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Competition that happens every 4th of July. And I, I believe he could sign a sponsorship deal with Nathan's. Uh, like you, you remember how Subway used to have that Jared guy? Oh yeah, the one who was fucking kids, right? Yeah, he did some strange shit. I, I heard he used to like record kids changing their clothes. What the fuck? He's a weird. See, that's the thing about like hiring these brand ambassadors. You know, you just never. Know. <laughs> <laughs> like, did you? It's like you know how a lot of these people like. There's this guy. Have you heard of this guy called Kevin O'Leary? Hmm. And Shark. apparently this guy endorsed FTX. So he's like the Sam Bankman fruit guy is honest. His parents are regulators. I trust him a lot. And mm. now I've been smoking him. <laughs> so I think with these people, you know, these, these this type of people, you just, can't, you just can't tell. You can't tell what people are into nowadays. People are fucked up. Yeah. Especially when you center your entire business around them. Where that was Subway's shtick for the longest time jared Jared yeah where if you're smart you'd be like mcdonald's and invest in a concept like ronald mcdonald's not a real person it's more of a concept or the taco bell dog do you remember that era so taco bell i've never had i think i i I doubt i've ever had taco bell it's i'm not sure if it's in india Mm -hmm. i think it's india i think it is uh, that Ronald McDonald thing, though, he used to be much more popular when I was a kid. Nowadays, you just don't see him as much. There were more characters also. Right? There, was, there was this purple uh, potato and mm-hmm. the Mr. Hamburger Man or something like that. They even had a cartoon series. Yeah, what happened to that? Uh, what, you're, yeah, what happened to that, man? I haven't seen Ronald McDonald in ages. What's the McDonald's brand ambassador now? I'm pretty sure they got rid they got rid of it or they cut back on it? Tequero, that, yo, yo te quiero Taco Bell. So Taco Bell had this little chihuahua that, that, was, uh, that was the ambassador for a while. 
Oh, is it? Okay. Never had Taco Bell. I want to try Taco Bell. I'm actually very surprised. It's not in India. If it is, I haven't been to one. Oh, okay. Oh wait, I think I had I, I've had Taco Bell once. I had something called a chalupa. I don't know if you heard of yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've heard of it. That's one of the best things in Taco Bell. Man, that Every... thing was fried as hell. The it's entire too fried? thing was fried. Yeah, it's too fried. The the roti part of it, right? The roti, they fry the shit out of it and they give it to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after eating it, I was like, whoa, okay, I should puke now because I'm not eating that much oil. <laughs> you weren't a big fan of Taco Bell, okay. It tasted really good, not bad at all, but it just, it, I would pay extra to have it fried in ghee than fried in oil. Like, I would pay like five times as much. Are you still like that where you mentioned like one time you were trekking and you asked the gentleman not to cook in the oil? Like when you are trekking, like do you still have certain standards you follow? See, I want to see with trekking, okay, you can't be really uppity about food. What you want to make sure is that the food you're eating doesn't get you sick. Because if you get sick on a trek, you're going you're gonna to get massively screwed because your health is going to keep declining. Because you will not have access to good facilities. So you want to carry like good stuff like you know, antibacterials and shit like that with you. Mm -hmm. But at all points of time, you want to make sure that the food you're eating is cooked properly. If that means it's fried in oil, that's what you have to eat. Is this an all day thing or you do it for a couple of days? Sometimes it's a couple of days. Sometimes it's one day thing. But... In yeah. any case, you don't want to get stuck and sick. Go ahead. If it's a couple of days, do you get a tent? Yeah, or if you're going with a team, they provide a tent. Or sometimes you stay at some hotel somewhere. Not a big deal. Okay, okay. I'm very curious regarding this. And like, let's say you got to take a dump. Like, do you do it in the forest or do you have facilities? How uh, does you that dig work? a hole, you take a dump, you cover it up. Okay, so you like really uh, like is this is a ritual for you, right? Because uh, last year, a few times we talked like you're coming back from a trek. Is this something that's ingrained into your lifestyle? Like, I you do really it once every other month? I do. I do it multiple times a month usually. Mm -hmm. I, I like trekking a lot. I think it's one of those things which makes you, which it kind of makes you feel really alive, mm -hmm. and it's one of those rare hobbies you have that's very good for your health. In the sense, every other hobby is likely going to make your health worse. But this is something that makes your health really good. Mm -hmm. You get to spend a lot of time in nature and you get to take like a quick break from work. And it's like traveling, but it doesn't take up a lot of time. So you, you don't have to go away for like six, seven days. You can just be done in three days or two days or even one day. Do you go with people or solo location? It depends. Sometimes I'll go solo. Sometimes I'll go with my friends. Sometimes it's like a group of six people. So mm. it, it really depends. Sometimes I'll grow with, go with some commercial group. So I don't care. I'll just go whenever I want to go. Sometimes I'll drive. But I typically avoid driving for trekking. Because a drive back can get really hard. Especially if your feet are cramping. Mm -hmm. And then you have to drive back. It's, it's a big annoying pain. So right. usually I prefer getting a driver for it or getting the driver for it. But yeah, it, 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 you should try trekking. It's one of the best hobbies you can develop. I really, really like it. Yeah, I mean, I haven't done it with a tent or anything, but I, I've done hiking where it's like I go up and I, I come back pretty much the same day. Yeah, I don't do much of that tent stuff either. I try to find like a place I can stay at if I... You know, usually you'll find like locals and, okay, can I stay at your house? I'll pay you. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, wait. And you don't know these people? Nah, man. Have you ever had I mean, a weird I, situation I, with that? I haven't stayed at people's houses usually. Usually there are these places, you know, where they'll point you because there's a hotel here or some place you can stay at. So not, not like staying at random people's house. But yeah, India is a very safe country, not much to worry about. Plus, I'm a guy, right? I'm a 27-year-old guy who's like 90 kilos with a you know, beard and shit. So people are not very keen on you know, robbing me or something. Okay, but, uh, so, but they're pretty accepting of like inviting you to their place. They're not like, uh, who are you? You look intimidating. Yeah, they're pretty accepting. 
see i'm someone who is so you know what what a lot of trekking people do a lot of especially foreigners when they come to india mm-hmm. i don't know why but they're so cheap you know they're just like trying to save every rupee so they'll haggle with the fast food person mm-hmm. i remember seeing this one trick okay she's she, she was white so probably from europe and she was there was this lady selling momos i don't know if you've heard of it food yeah it's a, it's a food it's like a it's a fast food and you it's sold on the street mhm and this lady was selling momos for like 50 rupees and this this woman from europe she was haggling with her she's like okay no 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 35 rupees 30 rupees I'm like who cares like this is some old lady 60 years old she's selling momos for 50 rupees to feed herself and her kids or whatever like just just give her what she's asking for So a lot mm-hmm. of these people they do cheap and that kind of is not good. Typically I'm liberal so you know if something costs like 50 rupees I'll just give like 100 bucks to stake it it's fine keep it. Okay so you hook it up. Yeah yeah I'll just pay them more it's fine you know these are like old people living in villages these economies are really small and for me 50 rupees is like you know it's literally like 70 cents. It means nothing. but for these guys it can be like an entire days worth of food so it means a lot to them so i will typically like give them extra money for their services because you know they're, they're like poor villagers man like come on like mm-hmm. have a heart these guys are they aren't rich they aren't millionaires they're poor people you can give them some extra cash like if you know for example if i go out to have dinner with my friends sometimes the bill will be like 5000 rupees and at that point none of no one's cribbing about paying 5000 rupees or 100 dollars or whatever you know mm-hmm. for a fine dining dinner but when you're in places like these people want to like bargain with the poor momo seller or someone selling water like come on man what are you guys doing man i can't even imagine especially after they're hosting you or, or especially no, in the context exactly what you're hosting. talking they make small shops on the road type of stuff sometimes yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing I've noticed with them Hirsch is that they're very hospitable. Like if they know that you're visiting, they'll just like they'll do their best to, you know, tell you about the area. So, this yeah, no, I agree with you. You definitely want to hook it up in situations like this. Yeah, and that kind of has other advantages. For example, these guys they, they aren't rich, right? They they're really poor and if you give them some money and you know you're kind you're not like being arrogant about it you're not like I'm the richest person in the world fuck you person throwing money at you right right if you if you humble about it and be like I'm trying to you you show that you're a genuine person mm-hmm. these guys will go above and beyond to help you and I'll give you an example okay mm-hmm. so recently I was trekking up this mountain and we we made a mistake so we went up one side and we came down the other side so we fucked up So our car was on the first side and we went down the other side of the mountain and it's getting dark and there's we there's literally like there's nothing we can do. So we find a guy who has a motorcycle and we're like can you take us to our this other village because that's where our car is and the driver is not contactable you know he is out of reach. And this guy agrees so we're like a team of 3 people here. Mm-hmm. So I tell the other two people okay so why don't you guys just stay here stay in this village the other side of the mountain and I'm going to take this guy with me all the way back and get in the car and then come back and pick you guys up so this guy this motorcycle guy random guy from this village he agreed to help us and he's like you know I have some other work to do so I'll just drop you here and then i'll be on my way so you please remember the way back to this village and i'm like okay i'll try and remember and i want to tell you that there is no signal here for my phone so you can't use map or things like that so i have to like remember the route okay so he's telling me on the way okay so this is a sign board this is where you take a left and it's a complex route so we get to my car and i just i just like you know if this guy has burned so much petrol he's driven me an hour and a half to this other side of the mountain mm mm-hmm. and i should pay him some money so i gave him 20 dollars so i gave him like 1500 rupees which is probably like a week's worth of income for him and this guy was delighted first of all he didn't accept all the money he only took like 1000 rupees he's like no 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 he he just couldn't take the money because he he felt like that'll be scamming me but i tried to like really persuade him 
initially he was only accepting 500 rupees but i kind of persuaded him to take the other 500 also and so now he took 1000 rupees mm-hmm. and i'll tell you what so this guy he spent an hour and a half guiding us back to the original place so he he's like okay i'm going to i had some work to do but i'm not going to do it now i'll do it later i'm going to guide you guys back and then he's like if you guys are hungry you can eat at my house it's ah, fine it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not stingy people want to help you you know yeah, but money, you... money isn't just a thing man it's like a actual like is this intangible concept that could tap into someone's nervous system if you're using it wisely yeah you don't want to be like i'm buying this service from you you don't want to be that you know you don't want to be like i'll pay you this much money if you do xyz things for me it's right. like, like okay just take the money and you know it's fine you know we we're happy you gave us whatever you gave us and people will generally go above and beyond for you yeah see these are the people that deserve tips where when i went to the bahamas i basically had this uh, guy that uh, was in a cab and he took me from one spot to another i gave him the fee and i gave him a little tip as well and he was so delighted by the tip and he's like hey sir uh, i have a proposition for you i was like yeah uh, what's your proposition he's like i'll be your driver for the entire day you pay me this set amount and i'll show you the hottest spots in bahamas i was like okay and he thought he was charging me a lot but it was nothing especially if you're converting the currencies and i basically just ended up getting this entire tour right rather than going to these individual spots and paying for the tour i got it from a local so you never know where if you use your money strategically what opportunity is going to open up yeah man i think that it it really makes a difference being generous mm-hmm. makes a difference you don't want to be so generous that people are you know incentivized to rob you or scam you yeah but if you feel if you act like you know the area you know the people you're not you're not like a complete idiot mm-hmm. and you're being generous people will people want to help you and you, people in most cases are genuine right like this guy he was going to drop me he dropped me an hour and a half and he was going to do it for free i offered him money mm-hmm. and i had to convince him to take the money so this guy had helped us out especially and, when you're traveling bro well, like why would you be cheap when you're traveling yeah i don't get it i think a lot of these european travelers who come here i don't get it like what are you haggling for and who are you, who are you haggling with like you're haggling with a villager who does that and, and then you make all the europeans look bad because th- th- how often are europeans being seen by these villagers no i don't think so i don't think they're ma- I, I, i think i think that it's not the common case for every european traveler to, to do that but i think a lot of these people who kind of come to india for like 6 7 months for like a long trip mm. and They, they sometimes they just don't have any money so i don't know why they're traveling first of all if you don't have money but usually these are like broke people from their own countries and they've come here to travel for some reason well, a lot of people do that ration every penny some of them actually beg well one thing that often happens is that someone will take a year off from college to just travel and to discover themselves and some other people will actually quit their job and do it where in my last job there was this rising star named Juan and Juan uh he ended up quitting right when he was about to get this promotion because him and his girlfriend were going to uh like backpack around Asia for an entire year so this guy was poised to get like this huge promotion like have this like nice role uh, but then out of nowhere he just quits his job and he moves i'm like well what are you going to do are you just going to eat off your savings he's like yeah i mean i'll try to find a job in like the local streets and he just pretty much realigned his entire life for this traveling experience yeah that sounds crazy because if if someone is working in india on the streets or you know like a random job in an indian village mm-hmm. he's going to make like 100 200 bucks a day he's going to make 3000 5000 rupees a month that's nothing you know you can make that in like a couple of hours in his country so it makes sense to make your money first and then travel but i think nowadays your best bet is to just have a wifi income like to make money online mm. what about digital nomads you remember when that was a thing do you see a lot of digital nomads i i think we'll see more and more of them in the future but uh, i think a lot of them will just travel to places like dubai where there are cheaper taxes mm-hmm. no taxes i mean i don't see the point of 
traveling to the US and accidentally staying the number of days you need to stay and then you become like liable to 40 50% tax so i think the whole tax thing is going to play a big role in that right i do see a lot of people traveling to india because india has a lot of english speakers everyone speaks english or at least mm-hmm. most people most tourist places they speak english in most cities they speak english all the sign boards have english so you won't have trouble with the language so india is going to be a good destination and that it really matters you know for example if i don't know if you've been to something like china but it's hard to find english sign boards in china and you just have to like manage but if you are in india then if you know english then you're pretty much as good as a native in most places that's good that's a big thing the, the language it's a huge thing and indian indian lifestyle is actually pretty good you have servants who do a lot of things for you and it's it's way more comfortable for example you have like cooks drivers cleaners and you you can't adjust to other places after you live in india i'm so used to having my food cooked for me my house cleaned for me my car sometimes driven for me so i'm like if i move to the us i have to do all of this by myself such a waste of time you know mhm unless you make a lot of money uh but yeah that's not really a concept like getting a driver a cook all of that unless you're making a lot of money here yeah but in india you can have them for like 5 600 bucks a month all of them combined what do you get them like uh, some of them are from the streets right not from the streets they're like normal people with families okay no no cuz when i used to visit uh, some people were like from the streets like they be like really little kids and they would end up being like the house boy no 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 so that's that doesn't happen in india anymore so you get like adults people who are 18 and above they have like for example my cook is this woman she has two kids and a husband mm-hmm. her husband has a job and this is what she does to support her household and i pay her double wage so the regular wage for a cook is about 100 bucks and i pay her 250 200 bucks because she has kids and you know i'm like okay i don't give a shit about 100 bucks it's going to help your kids out to go to school so i'll just pay you double not a big issue just come regularly cook what i want and you know cook with love so she doesn't uh, stay with you she doesn't stay with me she just comes is around for like 6 to 7 hours um, and goes home do you ever did you ever have a worker that stayed with you no doesn't feel safe mm Last time I visited I remember our help used to stay with us. A lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. I just don't. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's still common but you get it like per job. Yeah, you know, I, all of these people at least the ones the the people who will stay with you are people who have no family in the sense like they they don't have like a wife or kids or you know mom and dad to go home to. Mm-hmm. So the people who stay with you would be like someone who came from a different state and they have nobody they don't have a house so for them this is a good deal right they don't have to pay any rent or anything they can just stay with you eat your food and things like that and you can pay them like a slightly lower wage but uh, i i just haven't had that arrangement i i have like people who have like their own house their own family their own kids mm-hmm. and they just do this to support their household Like that's, a concept, that's a concept i love uh just having workers do so much of the busy work that you, you could focus on what matters for your life like cooking cleaning I mean, yeah, outsource that exactly and a lot of westerners they just don't get it you know they think that these people are being exploited but it's just a job for example like working at mcdonald's is a job this is a job and mm-hmm. even my maid has a maid oh the boss stuff No, it's just like everyone has a maid. Even maids have maids. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's just how things are in India. It's, it's like virtual assistants. Uh, virtual assistants have virtual assistants. Well, not exactly that, but what's happening here is something like this. Okay, let's say that the maid comes from the nearby town to this town and cleans like a bunch of houses. Let's say that she cleans eight houses in a day. Mm-hmm. Well, her own house also needs to be cleaned, right? but she can't go back to her town in the afternoon to clean her house so she has to hire a maid who works in her town 
or her part from do you get me yeah so that's pretty much the thing everybody has a maid or house help it's just normal here so yeah it's it's common i i like living in india i think that most people who live in india and get used to the lifestyle will not want to live elsewhere yeah no no it's definitely not exploitation but but i have heard that that that's seen as a common sentiment but i'm not going to lie like the, certain parts like it does get pretty strange where there were a few times when i went to uh, bangladesh i visited uh like a family member they had a few guests or, or, or a few servants and some of them like they would mess up and the family member would like hit the the servant what and, uh, yeah and 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 this isn't like oh like well, what like, this was actually pretty common like you could hit the servants and they, they would be like oh my bad we'll, we'll fix it i'm pretty sure it's changed now but um those type of situations where it's like whoa you know yeah that's wrong that's wrong there, there's a dark side too yeah but that doesn't happen in india at least if that happened in india the guy who is a servant mm-hmm. that would the guy would get beat up because these servants have their own communities right like they aren't like slaves Yeah, I mean I don't know what it's like now but like last time I visited was so long ago but uh, yeah I I mean I saw the good sides I saw the dark sides too. I think things have changed in 15 years at least. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And so now it is it's like it's not just a concept where it's great in India. It's a concept that it would be unique if it could be just applicable to the entire world. But I don't know how it could really be applied like because you're saying like you don't need that much money in order to have uh, assistance like that right like you See, could be a middle class uh, person and still get access to services you could be a lower middle class person and still have access to it a lower middle class person man that would be such an amazing concept just especially in the west but i think that I this know. is the last generation or the second last generation which has access to it even in india because these maids children right mm-hmm. let's say there's a maid who's like 20 years old her kids are not going to become maids her kids are going to go to school and work some kind of desk job or something and the only reason these people are working as maids is that they don't have any other skills which pay more money so in the west right if you if you take the us for example the reason why you don't have maids is that the average person in the west has a certain amount of skills and he will not accept a job as a house cleaner he'll do something else and p- the people who live there they m- they don't make enough money to pay a house cleaner because you know the cost of living is so high that that the minimum amount someone will charge to work is say let's say 10 dollars an hour and they can't afford to pay someone 80 dollars per day to clean their house do you get me like 8 hours 9 hours a day or whatever you know mm-hmm. but in places like india where there's like a big population and only the current generation has high education the previous generations these guys they don't have the skills but they still need to pay for things right they still need to buy things and they 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 can't find like skilled jobs so they they accept this type of work and there's so many of them that are just cheap because it's not skilled labor Mm-hmm. You don't need to be. You don't need to go to school to clean a house. Do you think twenty years from now, though, there's always going to be like that, like that group that didn't edu- get educated like that, where they're still coming for servant jobs? Twenty years, definitely, there's going to be a group. I, I can identify specific groups that are going to be around twenty years from now. I'm not going to say their names because mm-hmm. I don't want to cause problems for myself. Mm-hmm. but everyone in india knows which those groups are like i don't have to tell you what groups they are there are there are two or three particular states where they are common where they have like low education and it's not the people's fault right the education quality there is shit and there are no industries in those states so people just have to work like job but they just have to do menial labor their entire life it's like being cursed if you are born in those places you just it's like you you get the curse of having to live this kind of life because that state does just doesn't have good education or good employment prospects so you have to leave the state and then work as menial labor in other places 
So yeah, I think 20 years from now, it's going to be around 60 years from now. I don't think so. It's going to be way less 60, 70 years from now, but 20 years, definitely. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, with the, the house cleaning here, man, like I, I know a guy that owns a house cleaning business and he runs it very smart. Like He runs it sort of like an Uber, so you could order it on demand. And he just tells me the process of paying the like the house cleaners and stuff like the items that you need uh, like the like follow-up stuff and it's such a high fee and i'm like man like this is something that a lot of people invest in if it's like a big occasion let's say you're hosting a party then you want it uh somewhat clean for like a dinner party but getting it on a monthly basis i mean you have to make a lot of money for stuff like that how much does a cleaner cost per hour Per hour, man, I mean, the numbers depend. They often do it by, like, square feet. So if your square feet is a certain amount, they'll charge you um, an X amount of money because they can't necessarily know by hour. I actually asked that question. I, I recall asking, I was like, how much per hour? They're like, we do square feet. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of See, individuals, man, they're doing the, they're doing the Uber-style business. Like, I know this one girl who does uh, makeup for other girls. And she created this app where you can you can just slide and say that you need your makeup done, and she'll send one of her folks there. So th people aren't really going to hair salons that much. They're getting the the service delivered to them. Hmm. Yeah, she uh, girls are very into like if you're into makeup, uh, your hair and stuff, like you you want it to be tip top. So she can charge premium prices, especially if she's sending service to you. She's making a good amount of money right now. So much That's of these Uber, yeah. So much of these Uber style businesses nowadays. So business idea for whoever wants it. Hey, did you, did you have house. a unique uh, Tinder idea recently? Oh yeah, that idea is gonna pay off for whoever does it. The idea is pretty simple. A lot of people spend a lot of time on Tinder and they don't get dates. And the reason they don't get dates on Tinder is really simple. Their pictures suck. So if someone wants to start a Tinder business, this is what they do. So call yourself a Tinder manager or Tinder consultant. You help the client take really, really good pictures of themselves. You give them an honest opinion of what a prospect sees when they look at the person's profile. So for example, like if you're a chick, Chicks don't swipe right all the time, okay? They swipe right on a very small number of people and most people get swipe left. And they're just judging that by the pictures, right? They're trying to like extrapolate. For example, if you if you look rich in your pictures, you look fit in your pictures, then you're going to get swiped right way more often. And if you look like a nerd, boring person, you're going to get swiped left. So that's what chicks are doing. And people, for some reason, they just can't seem to get their pictures right. So you could have a business as a consultant. All your job is to make sure that the client has the right pictures, the right bio. And your running fee would be for, you know, make, doing the swiping for the client. You do the chatting with the girl, you know, so you send out the first message. And everybody knows you can't send hi because you don't get a response to that. So you have to send out some interesting stuff as the first message. So the consultant handles the chatting with the girl and sets up a date. And that's a consultant's job. So the consultant's job is to put a picture, set up the dates for you, and you pay the consultant a monthly fee. And I think that's something people will pay a decent amount of money for. I can see that. Especially uh, the first part of your idea, the pictures. That's so important. The pictures and the bio. Because guys by default often just hit right swipe. Girls by default often hit left swipe. So they're reading your bio. And if you're just leaving it empty or if your picture is like with your dog licking your face and you think that's being funny, a lot of girls will just by default swipe left. So from your idea, one of the most important parts is getting that profile set up. And I, I knew this one guy that took a class on how to you know, optimize your dating profile. And this class gave a lot of these unique tips where, yeah, you want one picture where you're dressed up, but you don't want all the pictures by yourself. Every now and then you want, uh, let's say, uh, another picture with your friends to give the girl the vibe that 
you're a sociable person. You're not just this guy that's always by himself. Another picture you want, <laughs> this, this was a funny uh, insight. You want like a girl that's sit, standing next to you, but her face is chopped out. Her face is chopped off. Yeah. <laughs> so you could just see the long hair. So the girl's like, well, who is that girl? Like that he yeah, just chopped out. <laughs> yeah. So he, the class was giving all these different tips on how to optimize your profile. And it's like some of the stuff are obvious, but some stuff you're like, oh, I actually never considered that. Yeah, the face chopped off thing really works. I've, I've done that a lot. <laughs> You've done that? Because it, yeah, because it makes the girl, like it, it tells the girl that, okay, so I have other girlfriends, you know, I'm not like some loner. Tinder nowadays, like, is a very dead app. Um, at least here. There's like just bots or people that are trying to promote their Instagram. Uh, <laughs> w- w- what's, yeah, yeah, just follow me on my Instagram. And then let's say you follow them on the Instagram. They never respond back to you. They just keep getting more followers that way. Um, what's taking its place is Bumble. Have you heard of Bumble? I've heard of Bumble, yes. Yeah, so this is the one where the girls message you first. And then there's another one called Hinge. So those are the ones that are taking Tinder spot. It doesn't seem like Tinder really did much to grow. It just seemed like they saw what's working and they just kept it as is. Um, and it just, the platforms just evolved over time. Um so Hinge, uh, Bumble, it's taken its place. Uh, it's and now they're called Coffee with Bagel. Yeah, Coffee Meets Bagel. And then th- there's like the niches forming. Like for Daisies, it's the Dill Mill, Salam. Uh, I heard there's one for like Jewish people, one for farmers. <laughs> so there's like these niches that are forming as well. Yeah, I think this is like, it's kind of like arranged dating, but the arrangement is done by the app, the algorithm. Mm-hmm. I, I will say that eventually all of these things are just going to cause a lot of societal problems for everybody. Mm-hmm. But who cares? You know, not my problem. I don't give a shit. I'm not the one using these apps nowadays. Yeah, these apps, like, you want to you wanna be wary of it because some of the apps, I mean, they have some strange stories. Well, they'll just set you up and they'll rob you. That doesn't always happen, but those are situations that every now and then happens other times it just desynthesize man that's that's a word that's always yeah, i can see that happen you know especially mm-hmm. with the, one of these gay dating apps let's say that you know there's some gay dating app for like lgbt people mm-hmm. but a lot of these people are supposedly not publicly lgbt so you if, you, if someone robs them what are they gonna do go to the police be like yeah i was on you know some lgbt dating app like you're not gonna may not do that so i can see that robbery should happening for homosexual people Mm -hmm. yeah so uh, with social media i I mean we're the guinea pig age and as with dating apps we're also the guinea pig age it also um it also dehumanizes people at times where since you're getting so much sensory data just coming in you're basically looking to disqualify then qualify you're like well what's this Uh, let me just find one thing wrong with this person and then i'm out and then the person does one thing wrrong let's say they don't respond back for a day and you're just like oh it's easy okay this person is a uh you're done and they just have very low tolerance nowadays man and not responding back works the other way around my experience yeah no like, that works as well where like sometimes you leave you build a curiosity but other people are just they just have no patience they basically just boil a human down to pixels and it's very easy to just have this nonchalant attitude towards pixels versus the actual person. I mean, what else can you do in the sense that if you yeah. are being bombarded by data, that, that's all you can do, right? What what else can you do? Yeah. I, I do think that this whole Tinder consultant idea has a lot of potential and is going to make someone who takes action on it a lot of money because there are guys who will pay like $1,000 a month for it or more. So if you can get a guy like eight dates a month, a lot of these rich people will pay like five thousand, three thousand dollars for it. Absolutely. So if you guys are listening, uh, pull the trigger. Yeah, you have to be strategic about it, right? For example, you want to, you need to know, have text game yourself as a consultant, and you know, to get the girls WhatsApp and you know, message her, chat in such a way that you know, 
you don't come off as boyfriend material you come off as like a guy she wants to sleep with or something like that so mm-hmm. you, you 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 need to have text game you know some people have like such bad text game that they just they text in like paragraphs mm-hmm. and they give off the vibe to the girl that okay so this guy is going to be a great boyfriend but she's not looking for a boyfriend right now so the guy is in gmi so what what the consultant needs to do is that he needs to text such that the he he communicates that this is a guy who's looking to fuck the girl and do not do it in a sleazy way you know you know one easy way to do it is just to call the girl baby all the time you know, like hey baby hey baby hey baby <laughs> <laughs> I agree baby. <laughs> <laughs> One hole in the idea is when the consultant has more game than the person that they're setting up dates for. <laughs> so the consultant's over here spinning all this game yeah, on text. Yeah, that's upsell, you know. Like I'm going to teach you how to do well on dates. That's an upsell for the that's consultant. That's an upsell actually. Yeah, yeah, no, that that could work. Why don't you start this business, man? I just don't have the time for it. Mm. I have bigger fish to fry right now, but it's a definite it's a good start of business for a lot of people. It is. It is. especially what you said last time with the matchmaking i see matchmaking making a return too some people on our side of twitter already do that where they'll matchmake from their own audience so they'll be like hey comment if you're signal- single uh in this post and then they'll shoot them a dm and then they'll find out what their audience members are looking for and then they'll set two people up that's a good idea mhm that's a very good idea i didn't think about that before Yeah, I think uh like an account we both follow Taylor Burrows did that for some time or she talked about it. But she she's like a brilliant account for that cuz she gives really good dating advice tips. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of her audience members are already primed to want that service. Yeah, Taylor Burrows is a pretty sweet person I think. I've interacted with her quite a few times and she was on my podcast. Mhm. I don't agree with some of her takes of course, but I I do think that she is the right person for this type of stuff. In yeah. the sense of someone wants like an arranged relationship, she can help. Like do you remember Kevin Samuels? I never heard of him. Okay, so before Andrew Tate, Kevin Samuels was like this really 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 big manosphere guy that was going mainstream and then suddenly at age 55 he died. Um I still have suspects about that. I I think something shady happened. But what happened was uh he was a very polarized figure because he was bringing up concepts like the high value man and he was putting uh, he was saying a lot of what women are doing wrong so some women were like kevin samuels hates women but another group of women were like no uh, kevin samuels is sharing a lot of truth well he ran this facebook group where a lot of individuals would interact right it was sort of like a community and a few people got married off of that group So Man, every, that's nice. Yeah, every now and then if you go on YouTube, you'll say you'll see videos like uh Kevin Samuel's advice led to my marriage, like those type of videos and like you'll watch the video and it started in a Facebook community. That's where the parties met. That's so interesting. I think we'll have a lot of that stuff in the future because mm-hmm. people just spend so much time online. Mhm. But I think marriage as a concept is not going to last very long. um why not i think marriage requires a certain amount of societal stability and not a big focus on individualism and of course the primary goal is to be aligned to survive and the primary goal of a marriage is to provide a stable place for children to grow up Now what we're getting at culturally is more individualistic so people don't care about other people they care about what's good for me and people nowadays they either can't afford kids or they don't want to have kids they want to have grasshoppers instead and you know eat crap and listen to mainstream news so they 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 don't have old culture anymore they don't want to have children they just want to sit at home play video games jack off watch movies and they want to spend their time that way and as the laws of these countries get more and more messed up where if you get married and divorced you get fucked as a guy you lose half your wealth and many years of your life 
And to top it off, most girls nowadays are pretty hoary, right? So you can sleep with whoever, whomever you want. You don't have to marry them. It, there are no incentives. I don't see many incentives down the line for people to get married, especially in Western countries. In the sense that mm. if you can sleep with the girl without getting married, you don't intend on having kids. And you can sleep with other girls too, because that's how dating is done in the West. And to top it off, if you do get married, you end up with this big financial liability that has a 50% or more chance of playing out. You're losing half your wealth. I don't see people getting married. And I think that you will see it in the statistics as well. People are not getting married as much or they're marrying later and later and later in life. Mm -hmm. And I think that marriage as a system, as a system, was suitable for older forms of society that were more collective in nature, but this highly individualistic culture we live in, uh, marriage just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I think that people will just do, people will live closer to animals than they do currently. Mm, So you're saying like sex is going to be on the right, like random sex with random people is going to be on the rise, but marriage is going to be on the drop. Exactly. So it's going to be like a a free market for sex in a way. So girls Mm. will fuck whomever they want. Guys will fuck whomever they can. And uh, there will be no commitment. So pretty much everybody is going to be unhappy except the top one, two percent of guys. Mm. See, because if you're a girl, you can't secure commitment. What does a girl want? She wants a guy to be committed to her. And she can't secure a high-value guy's commitment because a high-value guy is busy fucking lots of girls because he can. So she has to find commitment commitment from some low-value, simpish beta male. Low-value guys, guys who are not in the top 2%, they can't get any virgins or purer girls because they're all sleeping with the high-value men first. Uh, so these low-value guys, they essentially have to provide for and support low-value used-up women who've had lots of sex with lots of guys before. So they're not happy. And the only people who are profiting off it are like the top 2% of men <laughs> who can sleep with whoever they want because they're amazing. <laughs> Is this happening where you're from as well? It's not happening where I'm from right now, but I, I it's where the culture is heading. And I think in many of your countries, like in, in the US at least, you see you see shadows of it currently. Like it's not like very upfront, but you see the shadows of it. You have cucking and all these things, right? Like what's cucking? A cucking is like a girl getting commitment from some low value guy but having sex with some high value guy. Mm. A higher value guy. Yeah, in addition to that, another thing that I've noticed is that um, before we were talking about more sensory data with um, the dating apps, right, Harsh? Another Mm -hmm. thing that I've noticed is just more options where let's say there's two people, they're dating, everything seems in alignment, like similar core values. Um, They both want to settle down in the same spot, but one person wants to have kids, one doesn't. That's a decision. It's like, whoa. That could actually alter if we get married or not, because that's a big decision. That's one example. Another example is, let's say they're sexually compatible. They're, um, they both want to have kids, but one person wants to settle down in the U.S. The other person wants to settle down in Europe. Like It's like, my biggest dream is to move to Europe in the next five years. That's another big decision. Uh, so what's been what's happening nowadays is that since we have so much more options, there's like that one new option that could be introduced that jeopardizes everything. Like you could be dating for a while and then that one thing is introduced and it's like, oh man, like that's actually a big problem where in the 50s or 60s, um, that wasn't really a thing. It, it's It was like much more of a standardized process versus now there's like so much new options that wasn't really a thing is now a thing. That's definitely true. I think that you're 100% right. I think that that's one of the... It's a side effect of being a very individualistic society, right? Where everyone's just focused on their own ideas. Yeah, so like in my last job, there was this guy named Dennis who was in his... Like he got married to his high school sweetheart, 18, and now he was 60, 
five or so. And he was like mm-hmm. one of the guys. And then there was another guy in our team. His name was, uh, just call him Kawe. Uh, Kawe was like, man, I really want to settle down uh, with my wife. Like we've been dating for six years, but she doesn't want to settle down in Florida. She wants to move to New York. I'm not really a city guy. And Dennis's autopilot, like knee jerk response was, the girl moves where the guy moves. What's the big deal? And Kawe. Makes like, sense. Yeah. And th- that was just like, he didn't see any other like situation. It's like, wh- wh- what are you saying? Like, you're the guy, wh- wherever you want to move, she has to move. And then Kawe was like basically breaking down um, like how things have changed, where like, yes, uh, like that's something that was like the autopilot idea uh, back then. But nowadays, like, it's not always the autopilot idea where someone's like, uh, some guys move for the girls or, you know, here's the thing though. I'm just trying to say that there's a difference in terms of standards. You see what I'm saying? How times yeah, have I changed. And it's like, uh, so there's no such thing as like autopilot ideas now. And it's like, it just takes one of those moments for you to realize like this cowboy dude is over here dating his girl for five years. And then suddenly it's like this black swan is introduced. And now it's jeopardizing the entire marriage proposal situation. I think it kind of boils down to the fact that relationships today, they don't have a leader in the sense that there's no default tiebreaker. And that kind of leads to so many fights and just makes it much harder to have a successful relationship Mm -hmm. in the sense that back in like in a more traditional relationship, the girl would listen to the guy. And the guy would consider the girl's opinion in the sense that, so I would listen to my wife and I would listen to what she has to say. And I would consider what she has to say seriously in the sense I wouldn't just ignore her. You're a woman, shut up. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the final decision that will be made is going to be my decision. But I will consider what you have to say with respect and complete attention. But what's happening now is there is no hierarchy. So you have like the girl considers her ideas to be equally or more valuable than the guy's ideas, which is not inherently wrong. There's nothing wrong in that, you know, like she's also educated, smart. She can have her own ideas. But if you want a relationship to survive, you one person has to understand that the other person you you can't both get different things at the same time and be together, right? It doesn't it, you can't have it both ways? And I think that in most cases, it makes more sense to go with the guy's idea than with the girl's idea. Simply because if the guy, assuming the guy is the breadwinner of the house, because let's say you move to New York, but the guy's work is in Florida, like what are you gonna do now? Starve to death? So this was a situation where the like Kawe's girlfriend made more. In that case, I would probably go with the chick's opinion because she makes more money. <laughs> <laughs> so the money plays a big role. Okay. No, I mean, like if if the girl's career, if, if the primary breadwinner of the house, she made more money, but it wasn't like a lot more. Like she, oh. l- let's say he made seventy five thousand, she made eighty four thousand. Oh, okay. It's, you mean this roughly the same amount of money? Yeah, in that case, see, that's that's a hard thing, right? So that's like a 50-50 partnership, but now you don't have consensus. Mm-hmm. So it's an issue. It's an issue. And I, I think these issues are just going to make marriages much harder for people. I think traditional cultures had specific things for a reason. And I know feminists and all these people like to think, okay, so this is all like discrimination, but these things existed for a particular reason that these things kept people together. And uh, it wasn't just like some kind of blind hate towards one side. It was just like, if we don't have this and the whole concept of marriages breaks down completely and all the other ideas of 50, 50, all these seem like good ideas. Mm -hmm. but when you actually try them in practice, you end up with like a 50, 60 percent divorce rate. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can technically, you know, technically, you have the guy and the girl, they can do 50, 50 for everything and share every, you know, you know, make every decision equally. But that's like someone who has like zero relationship or life experience talking, right? 
when you have actual experience in life you realize that that's not how it works right you have disagreements you don't always have the meeting of minds and at some point you have to do something you have to make some choice and who do you go with you need to have 151 percent partner mhm and it's a guy who is a 51 percent partner his job is to make sure that he's not a tyrannical partner i mean the woman is not supposed to be a slave right you're supposed to look after her so it's kind of like this at least in hinduism this is how it's done in hinduism the woman is supposed to consider her husband to be her master but the guy is not supposed to consider the woman to be his slave the guy is supposed to consider the woman to be a gift from god and he's supposed to protect her look after her and you know act in her interests mm-hmm. so do you get me so yeah. this is like you know how like you have a kid right you don't you don't you don't try to fuck over the kid but you have authority over the kid mm-hmm. so you make sure the kid doesn't eat candy if you leave the kid alone all it's going to do is eat chocolate so you tell you you decide what the kid gets to eat but you also listen to what the kid wants right you don't always you don't just impose okay you can't eat chocolate ever <laughs> you can't do that you don't do that i mean some people do but that's not right no you need to create a synergistic relationship exactly you need to have the kid happy it's like that you know so i think a relationship makes way, it, it your relationship will have much more chances if the woman understands her role the guy understands his role and the woman listens to her husband and the husband takes care of the woman like he he actually has good will and what's the word he takes care of his wife in good faith right like you you never question the intentions yeah not just that you actually like do what's best for the other person too for example you know sometimes like let, let's say you have a kid okay mm-hmm. and kids can be bratty let's say the kid is that di- i'm just giving a random example let's say the kid is diabetic and the kid wants to eat chocolate you have to stop the kid from eating chocolate it's in the kid's best interest but the kid lacks the will power to stop so you have to stop him well the parable goes like one day the palm is feeling really proud the palm is like i want to be chopped off from the body and the body is like look uh if you get chopped off it's not going to be good for you or for me but the palm is like no 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 chop me off so the body chops it off and then the palm lies there lifeless now on the flip side imagine if the palm stays and does what it's supposed to do it does its role it does the feeding it does the grasping using the mouse etc now the body will take care of its self interest uh, along with the palm's interest as well so that's a synergistic relationship exactly exactly that that's that's a very good way of putting it so i think a relationship at least a husband and wife relationship it has to be complementary like both of both people they have to feed off each other and the sum of two sum of one plus one has to be greater than two what happens in a lot of these modern relationships is that the sum of one plus one is like 0.75 yeah you actually lose yeah one thing that i've at least learned from studying history system science etc is that 50-50 is an illusion what typically happens is one side leads the other side complements uh back to the arm example like are you right-handed or left-handed i'm right-handed okay so imagine if someone comes up to you and is like okay since you're right-handed i'll chop off your left hand like no i mean i still use my <laughs> left hand for other things uh, it complements a lot of the activities for my right hand but the right hand leads and the left hand complements and that's how dynamics traditionally work when you're going past the narratives the politically correct stuff one side leads the other side amplifies i like to view it like that i agree i agree i think a better way of looking at it is a little like this okay mhm one person makes the bread the other person provides the filling for the sandwich mm that's another good man you keep going back to these food examples bro you can be hungry <laughs> 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 yeah I'm hungry I am hungry I need to have dinner Arman plus okay, it's a long episode There's just one question you mind if we answer that real quick Of course go ahead okay. I think there's more than one have yeah. a look Okay well, another one just came in one day ago So the first gentleman name is Gajanan Karmasi Ready Yeah How do you guys form opinions on any topics suggestion I get influenced easily For example, if I don't want to go watch a movie but my friends insist a little, then I say yes. And then after coming home, I regret my decision. These questions are for both of you. You want to go first? You want me to go first? 
You go first. Okay, well, the first thing is how do you guys form opinions on any topic? I think the first thing you need to do is ask yourself how not to have an opinion on certain topics. Because knowing how not to have an opinion on certain topics allows you to be much more convicted on topics that you should have an opinion on. So, like, with all due respect, I, like, I think dolphins are a good thing. But, like, marine life and stuff, I, it's not something I'm well versed on in order to have an opinion. So, these are certain things I don't have an opinion on. Now, you could just scale this where a bunch of idiots often talk about stuff that they don't know anything about. This is a sign of a dummy. Now, once I see, like, okay, I should have an opinion on the topic because it is relevant to me or someone in my inner circle, I educate myself on uh, both sides of the issues, the sides I agree with, disagree with, and then I form the uh, opinion. Uh, to For you getting influenced easily, I mean, this is one of those things where uh, it's not just about having boundaries. It's also about enforcing it. But you got to know your boundaries as well. Um, a lot of times, like people stay in toxic relationships because they never had boundaries in the first place. And this causes them to just uh, not have conviction when they say something, which makes them feel regret later. So identify the boundaries and enforce the boundaries. Hmm. I would say to form opinions on something, you just need more life experience in the sense that like the example this guy gave, right? You don't want to watch a movie. Your friends say it's going to be good. You go and you regret it. Okay. So you regret it once. What do you do the next time? Well, the next time you learn from this experience, right? And next time you research the movie a little bit more before you go, you don't trust your friends because you had a bad experience once. So you form your opinions based on your real life practical experience. For example, let's say that you go to a tourist place and you buy something stupid for a lo lot of money. So you get scammed. You get scammed once. You had a terrible experience. The next time you go to a tourist place, you don't trust what sellers say. You want to double and triple verify everything. You want to haggle more, whatever. So you get real life experiences and then you form your opinions on that basis. And that's pretty much it. So get more experience and form your opinions based on your experience. Yeah. It's like opinions are a lot like electricity. Like you put put electricity through an oven, you get heat. You put electricity through a fridge, you get cold. Now, what Harsh said is like experience is key. Experience plus critical thinking. Uh, you put certain opinions through a human being, and you get wisdom and insights. Because life, math, money, or money talks, like we provide our opinions on a certain amount of stuff, but you know, like we do our best to provide insights. But you put opinions through another vehicle, and you just get a dummy. Like, um, like if uh, like these people that just complain, their opinion isn't grounded in reality at all. Um, so you really need to have that life experience and sharpen the critical thinking skills. I think the critical thinking aspect is also very important, right? For mm -hmm. example, if someone says going to Mars is like a very easy thing to do, like wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. So I'm not going to accept that opinion unless mm. I'm provided with proof. Like it doesn't seem plausible. It doesn't pass the common sense filter. But, you know, some things can, like if something is presented with logic, then it might make sense. So generally trust life experience where you don't have life experience, go for critical thinking and, you know, figuring out what seems plausible. Does this make sense? Is this too good to be true? And things of that sort. Great. Uh, another is from a gentleman named Ishan Singh. Question for Harsh. As you all say, you become you who you hang out with. What do you do when you're forced to stay with losers, like college hostel? I have two friends. They aren't full losers, just mediocre goal losers, scoring decent GPA during exams and watching movies. I mean, these guys are helpful during exams, but not so ambitious. Like if I share trying to wor work on this opportunity and I share my wins, they will get upset for a while and will be silent. But when I share my losses, they will be like, told you it's not so easy better stay studying college crap and prepare for 10 lux per an annual job ah so when you're around ngmi people yeah this is a common problem for all these hostel people so this is what you do you look up the term monk mode essentially what you do in your hostel life and your education phrase because you're surrounded by idiots is you you do monk mode you work by yourself you work on yourself 
um, you use these friends, quote unquote friends, you know, these wasteful people for occasional entertainment. So let's say that you've worked hard for two, three weeks. You want to watch a movie or something. So you go out with these types of people. But you don't want to be friends with them in the sense you don't want to share your thoughts, ideas, a lot of time with these people. It's fine to be alone. Just work on yourself right now. So what you want to do is you want to study hard, learn a lot of skills, prepare for your future, learn business skills, learn copywriting, learn learn everything you can, read up history, essentially become a somebody in this time. And this is the best time to do it because you have so much free time. For people like me and Arman, we have like a couple of free hours in a day, right? We have other businesses, we have work to do, there's relationships, there's a a lot of things to attend to. But as a college student, you have like eight, nine free hours a day. That's amazing. You're going to regret wasting this time. So you want to use all the time you have to be as productive as possible. And if you're surrounded by losers, just ignore them. Be monk mode. Be by yourself. Just keep working. And to blow off steam, you be with these people, you know. So you, you use them for entertainment, but they are not your friends. Yeah, and just to add on to that, you should also view content as friends as well. Um, don't just watch content, but um, following an account like Life Mad Money, this is uh, he is having a lot of influence on your thoughts, like the people you're physically hanging out with. So view it like that. You know, make sure you're following a lot of these empowering accounts. Try to engage with a couple of them, and who knows, they may um, they may be pursuing the same goals you are, or they may give you some advice as well. So um, if you have no one in your physical location that you can interact with, uh, that's what the internet is for. So try to interact with winners online. The internet is such a blessing for people like this guy. You know, if you're trying to like meet a lot of smart people and yeah. you don't have anyone around in your life, like, just use the net. Like last year, me and you were in the same accountability group for writing for a while. Um, and then uh, also I was in another mastermind group with a couple of people that we both know. And these guys just are so motivated. Like they're into fitness, they're into business and all of that. And every now and then we're bouncing ideas off of each other or giving each other like feedback. And it's good. It's like no one ever said butter knife sharpens butter knife. It's like iron sharpens iron. So if you could have these masterminds, you don't want to get in too many masterminds. Because when you get in too many masterminds, people just whine a lot. Masterminds are really good when it's like small. It's a compact group. Uh, you guys are from different fields and you guys can talk with each other. Like my mastermind, I don't f- physically see these people, but we're in the same DM group and we still like influence one another. I think I have a good idea. Maybe at some point I should start some kind of forum for where people can interact with each other and maybe even like they can meet up physically with each other if they want. Don't you have that with Telegram? No, I killed the Telegram group. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So there was another question from a while back. Um, so it seems like a scientific question from Serena. Any research at 5 a.m. work for women? Apparently, the calendar we follow is for the masculine. I'm 37 here in the Southern Hemisphere and can't get off the mark. So I asked if she was from Southern Hemisphere of U.S. or global. Um, since we both do or did the 5 a.m. challenge, uh, any idea? Yeah, the 5 a.m. challenge works for women, right? I have a business partner who is a female and she did the 5 a.m. challenge with me recently mm-hmm. and she found it to be extremely productive. I don't know why she thinks the calendar is for masculine. I don't get it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you can do the 5 a.m. challenge. It'll work just as fine for you as it works for men. Don't yeah, see know, an issue. I know my mom, she does like, she fasts a lot. So she wakes up even earlier than 5 a.m. So I'm pretty sure it's something that you could do. Yeah, I, I, I think I don't know if she was if this is a genuine question or like some kind of sarcasm because like the calendar for the masculine, I don't get it. Does it do you understand something by that? Calendar for the masculine. No, I mean no. I I don't know. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if you're a chick or a guy, you can do five AM. It's gonna be useful for you. You still doing five AM? Or you're done with the challenge for right now? Right now, I'm doing a massive cut. I'm cutting like a thousand calories a day. Mm. So I'm not doing 5 a.m. I'm just like waking up whenever my body wants to wake up. Mm -hmm. Because 
when you sleep that's when your body is burning fat and the last thing i want to do is sleep less and then end up losing some muscle so i'm waking up at like 6 6:37 and it's sliding back ahead it's sliding i think by the time i'll be done with this cut i'll i need to lose like 7 kg or something no okay. cut um by the time i cut be, yeah this cut is actually not that hard it's a, it's a small cut small in the sense you know i'm cutting like 500 to 1000 calories a day so not like very mentally taxing how much are you so, ending up in uh you mean like to- how much am i to- eating to- you had 2000 calories yeah 2000 calories okay we're so somewhere I, I right eat, now yeah i'm i eat 2000 calories right now and i'm walking like 10000 steps a day sometimes mm. more 12 13 So net deficit is about a thousand, like seven hundred, eight hundred. Okay, I'm doing something similar. I just notice I feel way better when I'm in the one eighty five range versus the two hundred five range. Like I just have more energy throughout the day. Another thing I've noticed. Similar. Go ahead. Yeah, another thing I noticed, Harsh, is uh, have you ever tried calisthenics or just like body weight workouts? I've never tried it. No, 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 no. Man, I've been doing push ups, pull ups, like squats, like. Uh, trying to do uh, like trying to go up to 100 um no no wait i i i i've done that I, back in covid that's all i used to do 100 push ups 100 squats 100 chin ups i thought when by calisthenics you meant those ring workouts no 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 it's just the body weight workouts but something about that man that feels good it, it just um you target these muscles that you normally don't target like let's say for just typical lat pull downs doing a pull up just hits different uh, i've been noticing that Pull up, yes, but I I would highly recommend against doing a hundred squats for you. Yeah, well, why? It kills strength. I, I mean, I, from what I understand, you want to be more strong, right? You want to squat heavier weights. When you yeah. do a lot of these reps, it, your strength goes down really fast. So your body I, adapts to doing lots of reps. So what I do is when I go to the gym, Harsh, like I, I'm in the actual squat area, so I'll do the. squats with weights and I, i don't do the hundreds but like i try to do the hundreds for the pull-ups and the push-ups so I, i'm basically occupying one part of the gym and just doing that i, I don't know I, i've just been trying it out because you know i've been lifting weights for over five to six years now uh, i wanted to try out like the primal workouts like pull-ups push-ups like just basics but with squats yeah i do it with weights i cut out deadlifts though man you still do deadlifts yeah i do deadlifts Mm. Nice. Well, good luck with the cut, man. I mean, this is um because you're normally every time we're talking, you're bulking. So <laughs> <laughs> Pixar doesn't happen, bro. You gotta chop off your head, and we we, we gotta. I showed you my, uh, my cut pick. You gotta show me yours. <laughs> yeah, when I'm done with it, I'll show you mine. I I went crazy with the bulk. I bulked way too much. I, I think I need to cut like 10 <laughs> kilos or something. <laughs> I feel like that always happens with you. It happens with me too. <laughs> Us brown guys, bro, we're just uh, we carry more fat. Huh? Yeah, yeah. We just if it happens with you and me and a bunch of other individuals like us, I'm pretty sure it's something, um, something ingrained within us. We gotta we gotta really watch out for that bulk. Yeah, it's definitely genetic in the sense that you know, like white people, right? They'll they'll be at like 16 percent body fat and have some abs. Yeah, but we need to get to like 12. Yeah, 12, like maybe even to single digits at times. But when you do it, you just feel so much pride, because in some ways you're fighting against the odds. Yeah, you really are, man. But make sure you take I the progress that... pics. Take the progress pics, man. Yeah, I'm taking them every month. Okay. See what happens is the first three months, your or first two months, you're noticing some progress, but you're still somewhat looking bloated, and some sometimes you'll second guess yourself. But by the third month or the beginning of the fourth month that's when it just starts coming in and it's like whoa man i just got shredded out of nowhere so the pics help you with that yeah it's a toilet paper analogy right where the last few rolls of toilet paper like just take all of it away <laughs> i never heard that <laughs> so it's like this okay Let, let's say that you have toilet paper because initially the circumference is more taking a couple of sheets is just going to be one round around the entire thing Mm-hmm. But by the end of it, like one or two plies is just gonna be like three, four rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very good way to put it. So you just lose faster as you become thinner. 
Yeah, and you'll notice like it's really hitting when like you'll eat a regular meal and like boom, you're hungry again. That's when your metabolism is starting to get activated. Yeah, I don't think I'll go down to the extreme shirt part because I just think it doesn't make any sense, right? In India we wear t-shirts or shirts. Mhm. And it's like is no one can see the abs do they even exist? Yeah. I- I you don't even have social media like that. Big. Yeah, I don't even have social media. I I I still want to retain my size. I don't want to like fuck over my muscles. Yeah, you don't want to like I think 12% for you is good. You still don't have the like a personal Instagram or Facebook or anything like that? Not yet. Black eyes. I think I might style. make one at some point. I think I'll make an Instagram at some point. Okay. Simply because people just keep asking me. Like, it, this has happened to me now in business a couple of times where someone wants my Instagram just to verify that I'm not like you know especially if you are getting a business from the internet mhm sometimes having some kind of instagram account with your face on it gives people some confidence okay okay i'm this is a real person and i'm not going to get scammed so i think at some point i'll just make an instagram put like five six pictures and just make it look legit like personal yeah probably personal like this is for like a consulting type of business not related to lmm or anything LMM. Okay. But like you get like a brand and client who found you from someone else and they just need to see that the fee you're charging you know if you, if you charge like a premium fee mm-hmm. people want to verify that they're going to get what they're paying for right and yeah sometimes you don't have like a reference they say you found someone at random or the reference who got you the client is not super strong so i don't know usually it's the girls you know they like do you have an instagram i want to see your instagram <laughs> I need to make an Instagram. It's interesting when people follow you from your like business content and then they discover your personal Instagram. Like you know, it's just that they'll DM me they're like, "Oh man, it's so cool seeing this other uh, part of your life." Like there was this one episode where I said what my Instagram was, and from that episode I ended up getting like 15 new Instagram followers. <laughs> you, yeah, if you guys want to follow me or money talks on un- underscore and Let's they're just like it. Let's share the screen. Yeah, so um, I I mean I haven't Armani posted. talks underscore. Yeah, and then um, someone will message me and be like, "Yo, man, I discovered you in this YouTube video you did three years ago on how to stop saying um so much, uh, or uh, something like that." And I just found your Instagram. Like, uh, just want to say what's up. It's like okay, it's pretty cool. Oh, you're okay. Sharing? Yeah, hey, pretty cool, cool profile. You don't yeah. mind me sharing, right? No, I don't mind you sharing it. I, I I don't post that much at all, really. But um, so follow um, our boy Arman here. Yep. All right, folks. I'm gonna this go. This is a ahead. cool picture. I like it. Which this one? one? I just want to have the long hair, man. Long hair, don't care. Yeah. One sec. Was that a mother? Yeah. Should I be putting it as? But is this like a personal? Is this what do you say? Private or? It's like a public profile. I think I privated it, and I think you follow me. That's why you're capable of seeing it. I mean, I don't. Oh. Really, I don't. I don't know if I really mind because I already show my face. But oh, okay, if you, okay. yeah, if you guys want to follow me, you guys can go ahead. Um, Sweet, our minds went cutting. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta take the progress pics, man. Um, Whoa, what the fuck is this, dude? That's a ball python. Have you ever seen one? <laughs> no. Would you ever hold one like that? No, <laughs> dude. So what happened? Unless was, its mouth has been sued or something. So this dude, this guy, uh, had a snake around his neck, and then I was like, "Is that real or is that just like a toy?" And then he literally gets it off his neck and puts it on my neck. I'm like, "Oh shit, it's real!" <laughs> and I, I'm over here freaking out. I'm like, "Hey, is this gonna bite me?" He's like, "Nah, man, it's a ball python." And he says it like I know what the hell that's supposed to mean. I'm like, is it gonna bite me? <laughs> and he's just like, no, nah, just hold it. And apparently, it's um, it's not poisonous or anything. So I, I got a cool oh, pick it, out of it. It's a python. I thought all pythons are poisonous. Let's see, it's one of the snakes that apparently isn't. It just has a scary name. Ball python. So that. Okay, the ball python, also called the royal python, is a python species native to West and Central Africa. This non-venomous constructor is the smallest of the African pythons. Non-venomous. Ah, okay, okay. 
Yeah, I think people who have pet snakes are just like, why, who, why would someone have a pet snake? Of all the pets, you can have a snake. Man, my cousin had a pet snake, and every now and then he feed it a mice or a mouse, and he's just like, hey, Armand, today's the day. I'm like, I'll be there, and I would actually watch this snake gobble up this mouse, and it was, it was pretty cool. Huh. The mice is live, right? I think they feed it live. Live, man. I'm like, man, I thought you guys give it like some snacks or something. You guys actually feed an actual mouse. It's crazy. Do you yeah, have pets? Man, I don't... No. Uh, do you ever get um, like a dog? I doubt. I don't mind a dog. I think if I get a pet, it would probably be a dog. It just that it sounds like a lot of work, like getting it, you know, making it walk, feeding it, and taking care of it, cleaning its poop. Who? I don't want to do all that. You need to hire another servant. Who takes yeah, I need to hire dog. someone else for having a dog. It's just like a waste of time and money. Oh, man, you got servants for any service now. Plus, the other disadvantage of having a dog is apparently once you start smelling of dog, you stop noticing it. But to other people, you still smell of dog. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. I went to this date a while back, and the girl literally smelled like a dog. And she didn't notice it at all. And I was just like, oh, man, I can't even eat. Like, it's such a strong smell. Yeah, it's very pungent. These dog people, they just don't realize they're smelling like dogs. They're used it, to it. But... It looks their face sometimes, and they don't, like, wash their face after, and it just dries up. And it's like, it's a... Ugh. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was like, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna eat the bill and I'm gonna dip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friend, fun episode. Uh, we went for three hours. Good start of the year, huh? Yep. Um, all right, folks, uh, be sure to drop a like, hit that subscribe, and we will see you in the next episode. See you, everyone, and have a good day. Bye bye.